Good morning, everyone. I would like to call to order this public roundtable for the Committee on the Judiciary and Public Safety. It is 11.08 a.m. on Friday, March 3rd, 2023, and we are conducting the roundtable virtually and streaming on the DC Council's website and YouTube at at CM Brooke Pinto. I am Council Member Brooke Pinto representing Ward 2 and the Chairwoman of this committee. Today is the first of three hearings the committee is hosting to discuss the emergency crisis of gun violence we have in our city. Today, we invite public witnesses to provide testimony on gun violence in the District of Columbia. I hear every day from residents frightened by the, pand by the epidemic of violence, especially gun violence in our communities. The numbers we are seeing are terrifying. The number of gun, hom gun homicides has nearly doubled these past three years, and the number of other violent crimes involving a gun has grown by one third. We must acknowledge that gun violence is not merely a problem facing the district, it is an emergency, it is a crisis. And as such, it is critical that we take immediate, drastic, and most importantly, effective action to address the crisis level rates of gun violence we see in our communities. We have gathered here today to hear from you, the residents of DC, about how gun violence is impacting your lives and what you want to see from your government to address this crisis. Gun violence is not a theoretical problem. <clears throat> it is kids growing up knowing the sound of gunfire all too well. It's parents who are scared to, to kiss their kid goodbye because they're worried about them coming back home at the end of the day. It is a community that is traumatized and calling for solutions. We can never lose sight of what gun violence means in the lives of our community members and neighbors. It is also senseless and preventable. We see much news coverage over terrible incidents of mass shootings that are far too common in DC and across the country, but it is violence being carried out every single day in our city that is killing and traumatizing our neighbors that needs the focus and attention. Gun violence is not just a problem facing the district. It is an emergency. And like any emergency, there is no simple solution. What that means is that we must continue to bring together experts, government agencies, and of course, the community to discuss and find remedies. And meetings like today are crucial to understanding the problem and finding these solutions. I'm so grateful to everyone who has shown up to testify these are not easy topics to talk about, especially publicly, but sharing by sharing your stories, you're helping to bring about the change we need to see. The district has stood up a wide range of programs to address gun violence, including multiple violence interruption programs and programs to support young people, adults, and returning citizens at risk of engagement with the criminal justice system. We also have established an Office of Gun Violence Prevention to lead an interagency coordination of this work. Our investments also go beyond the traditional public safety infrastructure. We know that a vast number of district agencies from our schools to workforce training programs to our mental and behavioral health services service providers are critical to the work of mitigating violent crime. And we have set up programs within these agencies accordingly and with that understanding. But standing up these programs is just the first step. In order for us to see results, these programs must be operating effectively, efficiently, and in true coordination with one another. We want to hear about your experiences with these programs, where we can do better, where there are needs that are not being met, and how you want to see your government show up to address gun violence. When I was asked to serve as the chairwoman of the Committee on the Judiciary and Public Safety, I made tackling gun violence the top priority of my office and of the committee. And I will say it again, gun violence is a crisis and we must treat it as one. And that means immediate decisive action. We can and we must do more. Lives are on the line and I will not give up on leaning into this issue and trying to make a bigger impact and improvement here. <clears throat> With that in mind, I have convened a series of three roundtables 
over the next four days to hear from government leaders, subject matter experts, advocates, and most importantly, residents impacted by gun violence. Today, we will hear virtually from public witnesses. Tomorrow, the committee will also be holding an in-person roundtable for public witnesses at the Anacostia Neighborhood Library, located at 1800 Good Hope Road in Southeast. That roundtable will begin at 11 a.m. I hope residents will be able to join us in person at the library tomorrow, whether to provide testimony or simply follow along with the discussion. Those who cannot attend in person, however, may watch the hearing on YouTube at at CM Brook Pinto. The hearing will also be available for viewing on YouTube and the council website after Saturday. On Monday, the committee will convene a third roundtable to hear from the district and federal agencies that play the most active role in our gun violence prevention and reduction work. That is this Monday, March 2nd. Those attending will include the Deputy Mayor for Public Safety and Justice, the Office of Neighborhood Safety and Engagement, the Metropolitan Police Department, the Department of Youth Rehabilitation Services, the Attorney General, the U.S. Attorney's Office, and the Office of Gun Violence Prevention. On Monday, we will also hear from several national experts on gun violence prevention. I intend for these three roundtables to be the first in a longer ongoing conversation about gun violence in the district and our efforts to swiftly and effectively address it. Um, I see we have been joined by our Ward 1 colleague, Council Member Brianne Nadeau. And Council Member Nadeau, I'd like to invite you to make any opening statement you may have at this time. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, for holding this roundtable series. I, I do look forward to joining in person with you on Monday as well. Um, but thank you for holding this series on gun violence prevention and reduction. I, I cannot stress how important it is to me to hear directly from our community, our advocacy groups, our residents, people affected by the tragedy of gun violence. And I ask that everybody here um, share their voices and speak loud so that our actions can be louder. It's not an easy time for people in the district. Um, residents are still recovering from the COVID-19 pandemic and on top of that have to deal with gun violence as our communities try to go back to some normalcy. People throughout the district are asking what the police, the council, the mayor, and the rest of district government are doing to keep us safe from crime. As a mom, a longtime DC resident, and as a council member, I hear you and I share your concerns. From my years on the council and before that as an ANC, it's clear to me that we must address public safety holistically. No one tool is gonna fix crime and as MPD Chief Conti said just last week, there is no magic formula. The solution lies in a mix of both short-term immediate interventions and longer-term measures, and I support both. Policing is a part of improving public safety, but it's not the only avenue we must pursue. Others include securing good jobs and economic security for our residents, ensuring kids are staying in school and getting an education, and that we have the programs and mentors to support them. We must also provide mental health services to people who are in crisis and may cause harm to others or themselves. Installing violence interrupters and credible messengers in the community to help diffuse tensions that may spill over into violence. Collectively, these, re collectively, these resources, law enforcement and public and social health programs addressing community needs, create the balance we need to keep each other safe. We know that increasing the number of police alone will not solve gun violence or even reduce it because violent crimes tend to be unpredictable and senseless, and that's what the public fears the most. Previously, the council has acted on gun violence, including passage and implementation of the red flag, red flag law I introduced, which allows community members to alert law enforcement when someone is planning to use a gun against someone else or themselves so that it can be temporarily removed with an order from a judge. And we also passed a law to crack down on illegal ghost guns. Although local gun laws alone cannot solve the problem of gun violence in a nation with such ready access to firearms, they do make a difference. 
Another way that actively reduces gun violence without increased policing is by putting in place credible messengers and violence interrupters. And I am proud to have funded and supported a group of people known as violence interrupters whose mission it is to interact with people likely to commit violent crimes and try to engage them before they pick up that gun. We hire homecomers, people who've been previously incarcerated, made the choice to build a different life upon return and now want to give back to their community. And we also have retired workers with relevant life experience in social worker education. These folks, which we call violence interrupters, work in the community where there's conflict and dissuade people and youth from picking up that gun. They are the boots on the ground, constantly mitigating conflict. They work around the clock and they are tireless. They listen to chatter, build relationships with people, and sit in the emergency rooms with victims, helping them make the decision not to further the cycle of violence by getting retribution on the street. These community leaders are also able to get people at risk of perpetrating violence, education, and even jobs to help them make positive choices that benefit them in our community. Addressing crime is complex and challenging. If it were as easy as hiring more police or locking people in jail and throwing away the key, we in cities around the country would have solved it long ago. Thankfully, we have a caring and compassionate community that is united and wanting a safe place to live. We have thousands of people working day and night to prevent crime in the first place and to respond when it occurs. And we continue to try out new ideas from residents in other cities to bring crime down. As Ward 1 Council Member, I'm determined to ensure the district government funds an all of the above approach to public safety and that we provide the independent oversight of the agencies that we rely on to keep us safe. I welcome any and all suggestions and look forward to hearing your concerns and ideas in today's roundtable. If you're a victim of crime and want assistance in being connected to resources, please reach out. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, Council Member Nadeau. I really appreciate you being here with us today. Um, now I will turn to hear from our public witnesses. Today, public witnesses will have three minutes to present their testimony, and those who represent organizations will have five minutes. For our first panel, we will hear from Michaela Deming from the DC Coalition Against Domestic Violence, Brenda Lee Richardson from PSA 702 Outreach Committee, Ankit Jane, public witness, David Bowers, No Murders DC, and Tiffany Johnson from ANC 4B06. We'll give you all a moment to join as panelists. And whenever you're ready, Michaela Deming from the DC Coalition Against Domestic Violence, please go ahead. Thank you, good morning. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Michaela Deming. I'm the policy director for the DC Coalition Against Domestic Violence. We are the federally recognized statewide coalition of domestic violence service providers here in DC. And that includes uh, domestic violence specific housing providers, counseling and case management services, legal services, and culturally specific organizations. Our 18 member programs are dedicated service providers working tirelessly to address the epidemic of domestic violence across all eight wards of the district. We know that 39% of women and 25.5% of men living in DC have experienced sexual violence, physical violence, stalking, or a combination thereof by an intimate partner. I'm here today to speak more specifically on firearms and domestic violence. We have data on the intersection of domestic violence and firearms. The presence of a firearm makes a domestic violence situation five times more likely to be lethal. An abuser's access to firearm in increases the risk of homicide by 11 times. Every year, more than 600 American women are shot to death by their intimate partners. That's an average of 50 women killed per month and roughly one woman killed every 14 hours. Intimate partner homicide disproportionately impacts women of color, Native, Indigenous, and Latino women. Black women were murdered by men at a rate almost three times that of white women in 2018, and 64% of those murders involved a gun. Members of the LGBTQI community and people with disabilities are also impacted at higher rates. Firearms account for more than half of intimate partner homicides and dating relationships also account for nearly half of all intimate partner homicides. The discussion of domestic violence and firearms is not complete though when we speak only about homicide data. Firearms are also used to terrorize, intimidate and control victims and survivors even when the weapons are not fired. Uh, one million women have been shot or 
at or shot by an intimate partner, and 4.5 million women have been threatened with a gun by an intimate partner. 67% of survivors believed that their abusers were capable of killing them. Another context to layer on is that men who eventually commit large-scale acts of terror in communities across the country often start with violence at home. According to Bloomberg, um, out of 749 mass shootings in the past six years, about 60% involved men who had histories or were in the act of committing domestic violence. The deadlier the incident, the higher the chances of a domestic violence history or gender-based motive. So in incidents with six or more deaths, the correlation climbed to 70%. This is the data, but we know the story is more per personal here in DC. We know that John Muhammad and Lee Boyd Malvo terrorized the city in 2002. That story also began with domestic violence, an unenforced protection order, a custody dispute, and repeated threats to kill that were not taken seriously. A more intentional partnership between gun violence prevention work and domestic violence survivors and service providers may be able to help answer the question of how many lives can truly be saved when we more meaningfully engage to prevent and address domestic violence. Uh, some more DC data here, according to our own Domestic Violence Fatality Review Board in 2022's annual report, 20 people over the age of 15 were killed in domestic violence fatalities and one child, bringing that total to 21, half of them were shot. I would like to add a note here that there are currently local and federal firearms prohibitions in place, which directly impact domestic violence perpetrators and their access to firearms that are under attack, including by the Fifth Circuit opinion in uh, Rahimi um, and other um, concerning decisions that look to overturn perhaps 30 years worth of legal protections. In my final moment here, I would like to highlight a positive collaboration. Um, we did have a small federal grant and a national partner where we were able to train 17 of the violence interrupters last year in September. The training was a promising beginning, but there is much more to do uh, in terms of collaboration. We look for increased funding and opportunities to partner with the violence interrupter programs to expand those collaborations. They do really incredible work. We greatly appreciate the council's commitment to addressing firearms and violence in the city and highlighting domestic violence as an integral part of the conversation. Domestic violence homicides appear to account for roughly 10% of the homicides year to year. Um, and we look forward to continuing to work with district leaders across governmental agencies to end domestic violence within the context of firearms and homicide prevention. We're available to discuss questions and the comments that I will submit have many more statistics to share. Thank you, Chairperson Pinto for the opportunity to testify. Thank you so much, Ms. Deming, for those really haunting statistics. Um, we'll all have some questions for you at the end of this panel. Next, we'll hear from Brenda Lee Richardson from PSA 702 Outreach Committee. Um, good day, Madam Chair. It's nice to see you again. And Council Member Nadeau. My name is Brenda Lee Richardson. I am a Ward 8 resident and representing Police Service Area 702 Outreach Committee and the Anacostia Parks and Community Collaborative. We are partnering with the Friends of Anacostia Park, Thrive DC, and Clean Slate to look at nature-based trauma-informed programming and respite in parks to uniquely address the issue of gun violence in the District of Columbia. We have already discovered that based on our youth outdoor learning model with the Friends of Oxen Run, the benefits of the exposure to nature in our local parks. It includes reducing stress and anxiety, strengthening immunity, it lifts mood, boosts attention, and sparks creativity. PSA 702 and APAC are also invested in dignity communication. It is a it is a unique it is unique to assess it is a unique uh, technique to assess how we communicate with our families, our neighbors, and in our workplace. This technique also looks at interpersonal communication, what we think of and tell ourselves, which hinders our personal growth and development. Negative communication skills lead to unnecessary conflict, toxic stress, and toxic relationships. 
APAC and Clean Slate are also exploring the two ACEs and the impact they have on gun violence. The ACEs are adverse childhood experiences and adverse community environment. Adverse childhood experiences encompass various forms of physical and emotional abuse, neglect, and household dysfunction experiences in childhood. Adverse community environments, however, are communities that have a high concentration of poverty and violence and or low access to resources. Um, excuse me, can you guys give me a minute? Uh, give me a minute because I'm testifying. Um, I'm sorry. Childhood adversity does not occur in a vacuum. Many traumas may be linked to the lack of resources or increase the threats, both mental, physical, and economic at the family and community levels. The effects of adverse childhood experiences are compounded when they occur in the context um, when they occur in the context of adverse community environments. For example, in areas of concentrated poverty where public policy, business and economic development decisions influence systematic inequities and communities, there also exist disproportionate concentrations of chronic conditions such as heart disease and obesity, outcomes associated with adverse childhood experiences. Community inequities include limited economic mobility, access to social services, poor housing conditions, systematic racism, and other community-based stressors such as violence and substance abuse. These environments often lack positive buffers that promote resilience, such as safe neighborhoods and parks, social supports, affordable and stable housing, thriving and diverse retail, and opportunities for employment and creative ex in, um, expression. So Council Member Nadeau, at the end of the day, we need to get back to good old grassroots social work, community organizing, and meaningful park engagement. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Richardson. Next, we will hear from Anka Jane, public witness. Hi all, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. My name is Ankit Jain. Um, I am president of the Young Democrats of Ward 2, a group within the Ward 2 Democrats, uh, formerly head of March for Our Lives Manhattan, but speaking today in my personal capacity as a public citizen. Um, so as you both council members said, gun violence is out of control in this city. Um, uh, I personally, there's, there's been several shootings within a few blocks of my apartment. Just the other week, I uh, heard one of those shootings from my bedroom. So um, we need to do something about gun violence. Um, but if you look at this, the, the, the statistics, actually, most crime is not up. It's gun violence specifically that has gone up over the past few years. So that leads to two conclusions uh, in my eye. One is that I don't think we should return to the failed mass incarceration policies of the past because they don't actually keep us safe. Uh, and I think the goal is to make sure that we're all safer. Um, and the second is to focus on the guns. Um, you know, if, if, if the gun violence is the one that's going up, I think guns are what we should be focusing on. And I would like to offer just like a few suggestions on that front. So first of all, DC has a, a, a licensing law, a registration law, I should say, um, and, and you have to get approval to be able to register your gun. One of the requirements to be able to get approval to register your gun is um, you can't have a history, you can't have a history of violent behavior. And, and that's important because there could be situations you know, if you just have the basic background check requirements of not having committed a felony, there are many situations where people have been arrested multiple times, that the police called to their house multiple times, but for whatever reason, haven't been convicted of a crime. And um, under traditional background check requirements, those people can still buy guns, even if they're a danger to the community. So what we want to make sure is that you have people who are, the police know that have a history of violent behavior are not able to buy guns. The problem is that the DC law actually only says that you have to have a history of violent behavior within the five years immediately preceding the application. So that leads to situations where somebody has had a history of violent behavior, but maybe for the past five years, there's no evidence that uh, of that of that history, and they can still go buy a gun. Um, there's an example. I mean, this isn't just a hypothetical. There's a, a case um, out there. It's titled. Um, Coles v. Metropolitan Police Department, where this is exactly what happened. The MPD tried to deny someone a gun 
because they had multiple arrests uh, record and they just hadn't happened over the past five years, um, that was overturned and that person was able to purchase a gun. And so um, this is an example where it seems like it should be an easier fix, where instead of restricting that history of violent behavior that can deny someone a gun to just the past five years, you could do something like saying that if they have an extensive history of violent behavior or some language of that sort, and make sure that those people who are, are a danger to society or potentially a danger to society cannot buy guns. And then I'll also say that I think we should return to the one handgun a month rule. I know that that had been struck down in the past by the courts, but if you read the ruling, it actually just says that council didn't do its homework and explaining why it was important. If we can go back and do the homework and uh, prohibit people from buying more than one handgun a month, I think that would do a lot to get the guns off of our street. And um, lastly, I hope we can work with uh, Virginia and Maryland to address gun trafficking because that's been a serious problem. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Kane. A lot of really good ideas there. Um, we could talk a little bit more about them at the end of this panel. We will now hear from David Bowers from No Murders DC. Good day, Chairwoman Pinto and members of the committee. Thank you so much for holding this public roundtable on the critical issue of gun violence prevention. My name is David Bowers. I'm a War Three resident in the District of Columbia. I'm a founder of the all volunteer No Murders DC movement and a former member of the district's comprehensive homicide elimination strategy task force. A memo dated December 3rd, 2020 was sent by certain former members of the CHESS, the task force, including myself to the mayor and council chairman. It was also distributed to the members of the council. The full text of the memo will be included at the end of my prepared written testimony. I want to highlight the first recommendation that stated as follows, that the mayor create an office of homicide elimination, violence prevention, and community empowerment in the office of the city administrator to develop, coordinate, and execute a district-wide public health approach to violence prevention and homicide elimination, end quote. I refer, I refer to this office colloquially as the peace room. The memo went on to state, quote, as noted in footnote two, the goal of this recommendation is not to create additional or needless bureaucracy. The focus of the recommendation is the creation of a team of individuals at the highest levels of government that can develop and coordinate a, a cross-agency, cross-sector approach to eliminating homicide in the district. Additionally, this office is similar in purpose and structure to the Office of Violence Prevention and Neighborhood Safety that was proposed by the Safer Stronger DC Advisory Committee, end quote. Madam Chair and members of the council, part of the logic behind this recommendation was that the city needs to institutionalize the consistent ongoing work to explicitly end murders in our city. This should not be an initiative or a pilot program that is here today and gone tomorrow. The school system does not come and go depending on who the mayor is, fire and EMS, MPD, Parks and Rec, Department of Public Works, critical agencies and the work they do are not a summer surge. They are not an election cycle temporary effort. Regardless of who the mayor or members of the council are, critically, critical city services work transcends. The peace room approach needs to be what I call built into the code. This office needs to be the place where an adequately staffed infrastructure is permanently in place to make sure that the city has a plan of action to end murder that is being acted upon, evaluated, refined, and acted upon again. This office would be a place of coordinating the interaction of data and ground truth intel with regular uh, interactions with government and non-government entities from a range of sectors, both nonprofit and for-profit. The place that answers the question when someone asks, where is the hub, the place where people and groups go to coordinate, strategize, plan, and report back on what is working and not working. The creation by the mayor in January 2022 of the Office of Gun Violence Prevention was a step in the right direction, grounded in some of the thoughts captured in the memo. And I offered the following recommendations. First, that the mandate of the office be expanded to explicitly include a goal of ending murder in DC, all murder. Second, that the mayor and council work with the office to ensure that it works with both public sector and private sector stakeholders to create a long-term plan to end murder in DC. The plan should include objectives, milestones, timelines, responsible parties to be engaged both inside and outside of government. The plan should also address the projected staffing necessary for the peace room uh, to adequately provide ongoing annual backbone staffing of the citywide coordination efforts. There should also be projections for the cost of implementing the various activities by city agencies and non-city entities. 
There are a number of studies and reports that have been completed in the last several years that should inform this work. One of the report even recommends its own version of a peace room. Third and finally, a recommendation that as part of the effort to engage city agencies, I recommend that every city agency be tasked to have at least one annual performance benchmark related to the prevention of homicide, mindful that we can model the interdisciplinary and interconnectedness of multiple agencies as a model for engaging private sector as well. Madam Chair, No Murders DC started as an all volunteer movement in December of 20, 2000. We have three guiding principles, one murder is one murder too many, the resources to end murder in the city exist in the city, and any time a murder happens, we should stop as a city and ask, what do we need to do to make sure this doesn't happen again? We know that the real fact is that over 90% of homicide victims and those who commit homicides are African Americans and a disproportionate amount of those are males in this city. We have a Black Lives Matter Plaza. Let's have an approach to ending murders that shows our commitment to ensuring that Black lives do matter, an approach that shows by our actions that the murder of over 3,200 people in the last 20 years, the overwhelming majority of whom are Black and Black males, will not be tolerated, and that no murders of anyone of any background will be tolerated, an approach that shows we are clear that we all have a role to play. Thank you so much for allowing me the time and the opportunity to testify, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Bowers. I agree. Um, next and last on this panel, we will hear from Tiffany Johnson, AMC from AMC 4B06. Go ahead, Commissioner. Thank you, Council, uh, Council Member Pinto and members of the Committee on the Judiciary and Public Safety. My name is Tiffany Nicole Johnson, and I'm here today as a second generation Washingtonian, as well as ANC Commissioner for 4B06 in Manor Park. The times we are living in are precarious from day to day, increased exponentially by the prevalence of gun-related violence within our community. Manor Park has not seen as marked an increase in gun violence as other areas in the city, but we are not immune to it and the trauma it leaves behind. We can all agree that the time for action is now. And while the DC Council has worked to ensure responsible gun ownership, access to illegal firearms remains a systemic problem. Some feel that an increase in police officers will solve the problem. However, that is not the singular answer. While I appreciate the efforts of our police officers, any resolution to combat gun violence must involve systemic changes to our service delivery systems across DC government agencies and include increased investments and collaboration in nonprofits currently engaged in alternatives to policing. Agencies such as the Office of Neighborhood Safety and Engagement will require full funding and implementation as specified in the NEAR Act. ANC-4B outlined our concerns regarding this in its resolution calling on the executive to fully implement the NEAR Act. During, based on an audit report in June of 2022, the auditor found that DC has yet to establish the Office of Violence Prevention and Health Equity within the Department of Health. In addition, the promised police officer clinical team within the Department of Behavioral Health, trained to respond to behavioral health crises, have not been fully assembled. Lastly, the audit also found that the longstanding data collection issues showing the impact of violence interrupters in detecting and mitigating conflicts have not been ameliorated. DC can ensure the safety of all residents with the current number of sworn police officers while increasing its efforts and its focus on ameliorating the underlying contributors to gun violence, such as the lack of quality healthcare, access to social, emotional, and mental health supports, trauma-informed care, quality wraparound services, and increased educational and vocational opportunities. Gun violence prevention reduction can only be achieved when viewed as the public health emergency it is. ANC-4B has previously called for divestment of local funding and reinvestment in community-based supports and services for this reason. 
On behalf of the over 2,000 residents of ANC 4B06, we thank you for holding the first of hopefully a series of discussions on best practices for reducing gun violence in our community. Thank you so much, Commissioner, and thank you to everybody on this panel. Um, we are going to do 10 minute rounds of questions. Um, so I will go ahead and we can start the clock. Akima and then Council Bernadette, I'll turn to you for any questions you may have for this panel. So Ms. Deming, I want to start with you and some of the um, ideas you shared about violence interruption work in this space. And I'm really interested in trying to identify people who may be at risk um, and making sure that guns are removed from those circumstances to save lives. How do you envision the collaboration with violence interruption? Do you think that we should have specific VIs dedicated to domestic violence work or work more in partnership with other community groups seeking to reduce domestic violence? Thank you for that uh, question, council member. Um, I think that um, one thing that we have thought about expanding would be this um, education program. We know that violence interrupters are integral to their communities. Um, they have credible messengers uh, throughout the communities. And so if we assigned only a subset of violence interrupters to uh, understand the nuances of domestic violence, the ability to um, recognize where it might be coming up in situations that we would be missing all of the other folks interacting with the rest of the violence interrupters. Um, and so I think on some level, it makes sense to educate all violence interrupters really about what does domestic violence look like so it can be part of the work that they are already doing. And then once it's identified to, to make those links uh, with domestic violence experts, our member programs, um, et cetera. And so I think that um, making sure that there's that education and acknowledgement throughout the violence interrupter programs and the folks who are working in the communities makes sense. Um, and then once the identification happens and that immediate response happens, uh, turning it over to our members, our member programs and domestic violence experts. Okay, thank you for that. And do you anticipate any uh, legal pushback about a more aggressive plan to remove guns from situations that have already been identified as potentially dangerous or violent? I think that there, I mean, yes, on a federal level, we are already seeing decades worth of protections uh, that have been recognized, upheld by the Supreme Court of the United States across all of the circuit courts, recognizing the danger, the unique danger posed by domestic violence um, offenders and those who have a protection order against them. Um, and so we're already seeing those uh, with a decision last month um, in the Fifth Circuit, um, concerns about those being eroded. There was some addition of uh, closing the boyfriend loophole uh, is what it's most known as in uh, the most recent reauthorization of VAWA. Uh, that was not a complete closure though. Um, and so I would absolutely anticipate that any further restriction of domestic violence uh, offenders, those who are using domestic violence and determined in a civil court, that there would be some, um, some pushback against that. Um, but we do have decades worth of even Supreme Court of the United States decisions that show us that those have been recognized um, as lawful and constitutional restrictions on firearm possession and use. Okay, thank you very much. And Ms. Richardson, you talked about some of the benefits of community groups. And one of those benefits in, in my view is that they are not the government. And many times that allows for a more trusting relationship. How do you think that the council, given that truth, um, better coordinate and work with community groups that are doing so much of this work on the ground to ensure that the consistency and focus of the government is supporting the efforts of these groups? Well, I, I'm grateful that you are giving us the voice, Council Member Pinto, because when you're working in the grassroots level, we see what works for us. And this meaningful engagement that actually started as a result of the pandemic has proven to be really helpful um, to 
reducing trauma. And, you know, I think the big thing is changing people's mindsets and people's behavior. And this gives us an opportunity to do that. And I'm sorry that I still believe that a lot of the funding that we have in the district is going down a rabbit hole um, for prevention programs because they're not working. Um, so I'm very grateful for this opportunity that you give us because the community decided that we wanted to look at something else to see what can work for us because we're not necessarily um, engaged with what the district is offering. And then the other thing is when the money is gone, the program is gone. Thank you. Got it. Okay. Thank you so much for the work that you're doing in your community to be part of the solution in reducing this violence. Um, Mr. Kane, I want to follow up with you if you're still here about some of your ideas that I think are really a really important part of this conversation is there is a problem with illegal guns flowing into DC and something that we are absolutely working with Maryland and Virginia on and the US Department of Justice to make sure that there's a consistent approach in trying to reduce that trafficking and those efforts are ongoing. But we also have people legally purchasing guns, as you point out, and some of those people uh, might have a history of violence and should not be legally allowed to purchase guns. Can you talk a little bit more about the one handgun a month rule um, and in your kind of reading of that decision where you think the council went wrong? So as we try to um, as we try to go further in our gun control efforts, that we can be do so in a way that protects us from legal interference. Yeah, sure. So um, I, I think that, uh, first of all, I'll say that I don't think it's something that like, um, it, it's not something that's kind of radical. Like Virginia had the one handgun rule month for a long time. Um, and so I, I think with the, it, it's important to have that background in, in place. And, and just from a policy perspective, you know, you have less guns floating around, um, it, it should result in less, uh, less violence. Um, on the question of like, you know, the 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 legal issue, um, I think the case is called Heller three um, by shorthand. Um, uh, you know, um, I, I don't know if I could go into like a full legal um, conclusion, but if you if you read what they say, the the like the quotes are like um, they they lack the support um, and, and stuff like that. I think that the courts seem to be taking a very, I guess what I'll say is taking a very fact-based approach in, the, in this question and saying, we don't see the facts in this record to, to uphold this um, uh, law. And so I, what, what it seems to me is if the council could create a very good record of exactly how um, one having one, uh, researching it to one hang on a month could actually reduce crime and then submit that to the record, that would have a much better chance of uh, withstanding scrutiny and and you have to think that um the fact that other states have done it too might help a little bit that it's not just a dc in innovation that it's it's a, occurs across the country and that this would have like long you know striking it down would have bigger consequences right okay well thank you so much for that maybe we need to supplement it with some of miss deming's stats about violence and murders that are going on um many times with legally purchased guns to me it seems uh, obvious of why these guns are so problematic and so dangerous, but I think you're right that for the sake of making sure that our laws are protected and honored, um, that we should be do our extra due diligence in developing those facts for the record. So thank you. Um, Mr. Bowers, <clears throat> your suggestions are very much in line with what the council and executive have been discussing lately around improving coordination among all these agencies that are focused on this work. Um, do you, what are your thoughts on making Linda Harley Harper the director of both the Office of Gun Violence Prevention and the Office of Neighborhood Safety and Engagement? 
Yeah, so I, I think that we need to consider an approach that will allow for um, one consolidated place that is the hub of, of coordination um, and making sure that it is adequately staffed over time. And so my, my answer is, is independent of kind of the, the individual personnel. And I think you're asking a structural question. Should a, you know, should one person run both, if I'm understanding you right? And I think for me, the notion of having, as it relates to the, the need for the hub, the peace room, as I call it, making sure that that is a place that is that has the adequate mandate and has the adequate resource to do the job that's necessary to, to do the whole of government as well as non-government coordination um, is is would require, I think, just more staffing, right, than, than what we have now. And so I think that just as a structural issue, right, trying to have someone who's running both the, the hub and another major entity that's doing the work may be challenging for anybody, um, no matter how kind of gifted and committed they are. And so I think that when we think of this work of trying to end homicides in our city, the notion of make, when I say building into the code and making sure it's adequately staffed and resourced over time, that it's built into baseline budgets, and that there's a real analysis of what would it take from a people power standpoint to do the kind of coordination and ongoing work that is necessary to get us different results than, than what we've had. Okay, thank you, that's helpful. And my apologies, Councilor Bernadeau, I just wanna ask one more question to Commissioner Johnson. Um, you talked about some of the violence interruption programs and that being an effective model. I'm just curious, have you had any specific interaction with violence interruption in your community? No, we have not had any directly in Manor Park. Um, our closest violence interrupters would be along the Kennedy Street corridor. Um, we are located near uh, Tacoma Park Recreation, Tacoma Recreation Center, and so the Roving Leaders Program um, would assist there. So we're we're kind of seeing it uh, flanked on both ends, but not directly in Manor Park. Um, and we have had a series of gun-related crimes, uh, which would be helpful. We have a lot of kids in the area with a number of schools, either within the single member district or right next to it. Um, and so it would be helpful to have that additional assistance. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, now we will turn to our Ward 1 colleague, Brianne Nadeau, for a 10 minute round. Thanks, Madam Chair. I'm not going to take my 10 minutes. Um, I'm mostly just here to listen and to be with you today, um, acknowledging the importance of all these voices. But I am so grateful to this panel. Um, I've, I've met some of you before, and I know that you are regularly weighing in, but I also see some new faces today, and that's really encouraging. So thank you for taking the time to participate in today's roundtable. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, Council Member Nadeau. Okay, we will turn to our next panel of public witnesses. Um, we may have some folks who are not here yet. So let me read your names and if not, we'll add some from the next panel in. So Kimberly Mason from Wellness Healthcare Clinics, JP Sipkowitz from AMC 3D, Shean Danita Dyson from McClendon Center, Michelle Chappelle from Moms Demand Action, Robert Vincent Branham from DC for a Safer DC. Let me see if you all are here. Okay, and let me move on also to Jonathan Hill, public witness. Tony Lewis Jr. from DC or nothing. Reverend Judy Shepherd Gore from Inner City Collaborative Community Development Corporation. All right, we'll give folks a moment to join and we um, can get started here. 
with Michelle Chappelle from Monster Band Action. Hi. Um, good morning. I think it's still morning. Um, Chairperson Pinto and Councilmember Nadeau, um, and thank you for holding this roundtable today. Um, my name is Michelle Chapel, and I'm testifying today on behalf of the DC chapter of Moms Demand Action. Um, I'm a resident of Ward 1 in Parkview, and I have two children at a DC public charter school. The message that Moms Demand wants to share today is that DC is well positioned to confront the gun violence in our city. We have excellent gun safety laws, we have a council that is engaged on the issue of public safety, and we have a wealth of talent and resources in our city to address gun violence in a holistic way using a public health approach. We applaud the appointment of Linda Harley Harper as director of ONES, and we request that she receive the necessary funding and support to carry out her dual director role and oversee implementation of the National Institute of Criminal Justice Reform Strategic Plan. And I was listening earlier when you um, asked David Bowers the question about her dual role, and I definitely echo his thoughts on this issue. Um, when we think about gun violence as a public health issue, three words immediately come to mind, intervention, prevention, and transformation. DC's violence interrupters work in some of the same dangerous situations as MPD but without the benefit of signing bonuses, salary step-ups, a powerful union, and I could go on and on. We could ask, we ask that you ensure that these organizations are sufficiently funded so that they can provide multi-year contracts, professional development, training, and just compensation for the life-saving work that frontline staff performs. One of the opportunities for DC to improve its violence intervention is through growth of the Hospital-Based Violence Intervention Program, or HVIP. Everybody knows that DC has gun violence hotspots where repeated shootings occur, which is why Building Blocks DC was created. We also know that hospital-based violence intervention works best when paired with community-based work, but there is currently insufficient coordination between Building Blocks and DC HVIP. Currently, DC HVIP is only funded through OVSJG grants, but we believe that under the new Hospital and Health Equity Committee, there should be a way to create more funding for this vital program. And prevention is where we can focus on our youth and our schools. In addition um, to the recommendation in the NICJR plan, Everytown Research put out a report last August titled How to Stop Shootings and Gun Violence in Schools, which contains helpful recommendations for preventing young people from picking up weapons and also from being victimized or traumatized in other ways. We want to foster trusting school environments where students in crisis can receive support and not punishment and over-policing. Finally, transformation. A long-term reduction in gun violence will require real investments in the DC communities that have been under-resourced for generations. According to MPD, Last year, Ward 8 had 69 of DC's 174 homicides committed with a gun, while Ward 3 had one. The goal is for none of DC's wards, none of DC's families to suffer the pain of having a loved one taken by gun violence. But there are neighborhoods in DC with disproportionate violence, and those neighborhoods also have disproportionate poverty. We cannot pretend that we can solve one problem without addressing the other. And I would just like to add one comment in my personal capacity in response to the federal overreach that is pending regarding the revised criminal code. Several of the provisions in the RCC address gun violence specifically, <clears throat> increasing penalties for possession of ghost guns and assault weapons, creating a new offense for firing a gun in a public space, and allowing multiple weapons offenses and penalty enhancements in a single case. I urge the council to push back against the narrative that the RCC is soft on crime and to demand that DC home rule be respected. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Ms. Chappelle. I have some questions for you at the end of this panel. Okay, we will next hear from Shean Danita Dyson from McClendon Center. Good afternoon, Chairperson Pinto, Councilwoman Nadeau, and other attendees. 
My name is Shean Danita Dyson. I'm the president and CEO of McClendon Center. McClendon Center is a nonprofit organization that provides mental health care and care coordination to the district's most vulnerable adults. I'm present today to speak about the impact of gun violence within our community. One of our business locations is located at North Capitol Street Northwest and O Street Northwest. I've been with the organization for 15 years. As a worker within the community for more than a decade, I've had the opportunity to observe the impact of gun violence right outside of our door. August 24th, 2022, shortly before 1 p.m., two shooters got out of a black SUV and opened fire right outside our door. Two men did not survive and others were injured. October 6, 2022, on the 1200 block of North Capitol, at around 1.10 p.m., four men were found with gunshot wounds right down the street. Just in our corner of Truxton Circle, over the last four years, homicides have more than doubled when compared to the previous four-year period. We've seen a 140% increase. 24 souls have been murdered within 2,000 feet of our location in the last four years. Over the last four years, there have been more than four incidents where my community-based staff have narrowly missed being involved in community gun violence across the District of Columbia. One of the most poignant statements I've read, which was written by Peace for DC.org, stated the following, gun violence is not an intractable problem. 70% of DC gun violence is driven by approximately 500 identifiable individuals. Most of this violence is cyclical and retaliatory. Therefore, it is predictable. By working together to scale proven solutions, we can save lives right now. So what is the solution? Um, this is something I think about, I think about often. Um, though I'm not a DC resident, I've been here for a long time and I've seen the impact of gun violence. First, we must throw away assumptions and follow the data. We must continue to provide intensive intervention services to high-risk individuals. The city must expand its street and community outreach program, which also includes the interventions to offenders and victims in hospital settings following gun violence. We must push as many resources as possible to our communities to create alternative pathways for our at-risk community members, vocational training, mental health support and counseling, because these same at-risk individuals are also victims of violent crime, abuse and neglect, and therefore becomes a cycle. Mentoring. We must ensure that those resources are utilized appropriately and ethically with consistent oversight, and then also continued police presence. The McClendon Center's mission is to support and empower people on the journey to becoming their best selves. We do this every day, but in order to do this, we must, we definitely need to be able to provide those essential services and safe communities. I'm passionate about this topic because of the clients we serve, their family and their neighbors, and the staff who both live and travel to the city each day to provide care. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Ms. Dyson. We will next go to Tony Lewis Jr. from DC or nothing. Good afternoon. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, for convening this opportunity for to hear from the community. Um, hello to the War One Council member, um, Brianne Nadeau. Good to see you as well. Um, you know, it's, I'm sitting here listening to uh, the, the uh, prior panelists um, whose office is 40 feet from my lifelong home. Um, those shootings that she spoke of where my friends were involved. Um, and so I've grown up, for, I'll be 43 this year, and so I've been in this community my entire life. And gun violence has been a part of my entire existence. And uh, my professional life has been, the last 23 years has been, um, you know, primarily focus on trying to help people pivot and avoid um, premature death um, and recover from the trauma of incarceration. Um, and seeing people that um, I know and love continuously die, um, be victims of gun violence um, in terms of just being shot and or going to prison um, has really uh, crafted uh, my perspective on this issue. I feel like the city has done um, 
a, a great job of building an ecosystem to gun violence. Um, and there's more work to be done, but we've, we've made a lot of strides. Um, I think where the rubber meets the road though, um, connecting all the dots is we have to have a war on poverty. Poverty, um, as Aristotle stated, was, is the parent of revolution and crime. And we see uh, where you see the highest uh, you know, occurrences of gun violence uh, in our city. Um, it's in communities that's, that's you know, ravaged with poverty. Um, and when you look even deeper, you see there's mainly um, poor black people from DC. And so as a city, we can be hyper-focused on creating true pathways, sustainable pathways to economic um, prosperity for black people from DC. I feel like that's our best shot uh, at curbing gun violence. One of the primary things that I've seen in my career is, you know, whether you say, for example, um, Project Empowerment or Juan's Pathways Program, or even our violence interrupters or the violence interrupter organizations, uh, they have an inability to really guarantee or ferry people to uh, family sustaining employment. How does that trickle down, right? These people that we're talking about that may be the drivers of violence, they belong to somebody and people belong to them. So we talk about the uptick in youth crime and youth violence, um, but those children come from destabilized environments where adults cannot um, be the role models that they will wanna be because if they've been touched by the criminal justice system, they can't get the jobs they, that they want. Uh, we need the business community to uh, model what you see in the community-based organizations in terms of returning citizen hiring. Um, even our local, our DC government has done a relatively good job of hiring returning citizens, but that needs to be expanded. Things do not trickle down to the communities that have been the most impacted by gun violence, right? And when we look at who's unemployed, who's housing insecure, who's victims of violent crime, who's going to prison, um, who's dealing with mental health crisis, who's dealing with uh, overdose and addiction. Uh, it's black people from DC. So as a city, we have to come together to devise a plan um, and systems that are coordinated to ensure that people have a real shot uh, at economic prosperity. Without that, uh, we'll be having these conversations um, continuously. Um, it's not a matter of law enforcement or uh, programs are just marginalized because they can't get people in a space where people can truly turn away from uh, situations that lead to these uh, tragic occurrences. Um, and so all the things that were said before me, I agree with, but addressing poverty is our best chance at addressing gun violence in our city. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Lewis, for that powerful testimony and all the work that you do in this space. I look forward to chatting with you after this panel. <clears throat> Next, we will hear from Reverend Judy Shepard Gore from Inner City Collaborative Community Development Corporation. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, Council Member Pinto, and, and thank you for the opportunity to speak um, to the panelists and members of the council. I think um, as many of my um, other colleagues have said before that I've been listening to, uh, statistics show where the heart of the issues are. And as a member of the community who continues to seek out solutions through our, our mentoring, therapeutic and counseling programs, intensive case management, um, we, we see it up face, um, we see it in, in a very personal light. Um, through our efforts, we provide credible messengers to CFSA, uh, Child and Family Services Agency and Department of Youth Rehabilitation Services Youth, uh, Committed Youth, as well as provide um, intensive um, case management uh, through violence interrupters, through oh. our case management program. And, you, you know, we all, and just recently um, were awarded a Cure the Street um, violence interrupter grant in the neighborhoods of wards one and four and, and pleased to be working with um, Fernando and Janice George mm. to augment mm. some of the, the um, mm. problems that we see mm. in those areas of one and four. Um, so we see what that um, there is a, you know, there is a huge problem, but I think it's also 
good, but I couldn't see that. Vinny for us. But I forgot to say something, but I, I'm sure I, I'll get asked um, a question about it. Sorry, excuse me, Reverend. Um, about record selling. Mr. Lewis, you're not on mute if you could turn yourself on mute. No worries. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Reverend. <laughs> Yes, so we're continuing at Inner City to look at innovative and creative ways to not only be in the intervention space, but to be in the prevention space as well. I know that um, education is a uh, um, education around substance abuse and conflict resolution is at the core and the heart and center of what we do. So our efforts, especially um, in the last couple of weeks, we've been strategizing, excuse me, a couple of months to create an initiative that will be centered on um, being alive and well um, and to start a campaign called the Awareness Campaign um, that would allow us to look at, you know, really doing advertising and promotions in, in a way that our young people could understand and become a part of um, into the right into the DC public school system where we could you know, offer education and training on topics such as restorative justice, conflict resolution, along with artistic leadership programs that are offered to middle and high school students that live in these neighborhoods that are traumatized the most by the gun violence. Um, we are right now working with uh, Cardoza um, High School and Middle School to create such a program that would inspire young people um, to, to utilize their talents um, through social media and music to do it in a more positive way. Um, and, a, and, and the campaign would be launched um, as a three, three prong uh, approach. And, and just like the campaigns um, that the Surgeon General um, put out and put together around uh, cigarette smoking, you know, the messaging and the branding on, on the cigarette packages that cigarette smoking was hazardous to your health. Well, we, we want to put out gun violence is, is hazardous to everyone's health and, and really saturate the, the, the uh, social platforms that our young people engage into, but do the same, you know, have the same type of advertisement dollars committed um, to this initiative through community cap collaboration. Um, and in order to promote buy-in, the business community, government agencies, and social service agencies could share the costs of putting these billboards up and, and really going with me and coming along with me um, in creating the programs that we could take into the schools that would make it a part of the education curriculum. Um, I hope to, to um, that this type of messaging and this type of branding around uh, making the young people feel important and a part of the work, they can be a part of the solution instead of us always, you know, putting uh, programs that that suggest that or or make statements that suggest that programs don't work. I, I think what we have to do is be creative with working with the ones that do work and and. And I think that if we did this and, and, and brought the Alive campaign um, to the forefront, introducing it to the schools and, uh, um, and giving us the opportunity to show that um, if we gave the students themselves at the middle high school and even the elementary level an opportunity to be educated, I think uh, on conflict resolution, on um, restorative justice, that we could build the community around them that was going to support them in making better decisions about picking guns up in the first place. We, we see all too often young people coming out of the same households, modeling behavior that their older siblings have represented, you know, out of need. I mean, Mr. Lewis talked about poverty, and there is definitely a huge issue. So the solution is is multiple lists and multiple opportunities for all of us to work cohesively um, to bring about the solution to, to gun violence before your time. Thank you so much, Reverend. A lot of great ideas in there. I look forward to speaking with you more about those. Um, next and last on this panel, we will hear from Katie Donnelly from the Children's National Hospital. 
Uh, <clears throat> good afternoon, Chairperson Pinto and Chair and uh, Member uh, Nadal. Uh, Nada. For the record, my name is Katie Donnelly. I'm a pediatric emergency medicine physician in the Emergency Medicine and Trauma Center at Children's National. I'm also a resident of the district in Ward 4. I am the medical director for the Youth Violence Intervention Program at Children's National, funded through the Office of Victim Services and Justice Grants. The Youth Violence Intervention Program is a, is a member of Project Change, the district's coordinated network of hospital-based violence intervention programs. On behalf of Children's National Hospital and the Emergency Medicine and Trauma Center, I want to thank you for convening this roundtable on a significant issue facing the children and the residents of the District of Columbia. As the largest pediatric provider in the region, Children's National was pleased to launch the only pediatric hospital-based violence intervention program in the District of Columbia in January of 2022. The Youth Violence Intervention Program at Children's National provides victim services to youth and their families following community-based interpersonal violence, which includes gunshot injuries, stabbing injuries, and serious physical assaults. We provide trauma-informed services both soon after the injury and the following months, such as mentorship, case management, and safety planning. We coordinate with schools, medical providers, the justice system, and mental health providers to promote healing and avoid retaliation after a serious violent injury. We do this work to try to interrupt the cycle of violence that too often sees those who are hurt become those who are hurt again or hurt others. There is scientific evidence that hospital-based violence intervention programs or HVIPs reduce rates of re-injury, reduce arrests for future violent crime and increase employment in participants. The Health Alliance for Violence Intervention or the HAVI serves as the organizing network for these programs, providing guidance and opportunities to collaborate. The more research needs to be done, especially for pediatric patients, HVIPs are a promising tool to combat gun violence. As you know, community gun violence, especially gun violence, continues to impact the children of the District of Columbia. For example, one in 10 victims of gun violence in DC are under the age of 18. 17% of teenagers seen in our emergency department have seen someone shot, stabbed, or killed. This fiscal year is currently on track to see the largest number of children injured by firearms at Children's National. Therefore, our, our program continues to be necessary to reach our goal of supporting every victim of violence in the district, no matter their age. In FY 2022, Children's National enrolled 107 adolescents and their families for case management and mentorship and had over 200 encounters. These children have been survivors of community violence, most often gun violence. They struggle with feeling safe, with returning to school and with new life-changing medical diagnoses. We have provided case management, mentorship, and safety planning services. We have made warm referrals to hospital and community services. Our work has be expanded beyond the hospital, often meeting our clients where they are, whether that is at home, on the streets, in lockup, or most unfortunately, at the funerals of their friends and families. I will tell the story of one of our clients whose journey illustrates the work of our program. This young man was shot multiple times and required an extensive hospital stay. Our team met with him and his family in the hospital and along with his medical team, helped coordinate a safe discharge plan for home. We've been working to address the barriers his family faces to receiving medical care, helping them schedule appointments and provide transportation, including to a very necessary follow-up surgery. Our team encouraged him to go back to school and help the school feel comfortable with his medical needs. I'm happy to say that teachers and students welcomed him back with open arms. We are working to get him in a summer job placement where he can feel safe and learn valuable life skills. This level of intensive case management is not uncommon for our clients, especially those most significantly injured. Our program will continue to need support to both keep the level of engagement we currently have and to expand to be able to serve every violently injured child that comes to our doors. In considering what else works to prevent gun, gun violence, I would draw your attention to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's comprehensive technical pa package for the prevention of youth violence and associated risk behaviors. There is no one easy fix for gun violence, as you've mentioned. To stem this tie, we must invest early and often in our children. This includes quality education early in life and school-based educational programs that focus on social and emotional skills. It also means developing mentoring opportunities and after-school programs, which have sadly been hit uh, following the COVID-19 pandemic. We need to strengthen our communities as well through infrastructure investments, making them safe to work, live, and play in. And finally, as other folks have mentioned on this call, we need more coordination between the different organizations, both governmental and community, that are serving youth and families. Too long have we been siloed, either unable or unwilling to share information and resources. We are appreciative of the opportunity we have to serve the children of the district who have survived community violence. We are inspired every day by our clients' resilience, determination, and joy. 
We look forward to continuing to collaborate on this important and challenging work to help serve all the citizens of, the, of DC, regardless of their age. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Donnelly, and thank you to everybody on this panel. Really powerful ideas shared. Um, I want to start with you, Ms. Dyson, and I really appreciate you sharing the experience of so much trauma and shootings that you've seen and witnessed in your area. Has there been hospital-based work at your location that you've seen or that you can uh, expand upon? Great question. You know, as a community um, behavioral health organization, we haven't had any hospital um, integration or intervention services that we're aware of. Um, I know it's definitely needed, and that's why I spoke on that. I'm not as well versed on some of the resources that people are accessing, so I think a, a bit of it is um, knowledge of the community of what resources are actually available how folks access it, and then just general care coordination. Um, you know, being in the community where we are currently, we've seen it change so much. And Mr. Lewis speaks so um, clearly on how the neighborhood has really struggled. And I've been there so long to really see a lot of the ups and downs. And I know that resources are there, but I don't know how easily they're accessed. So, you know areas of improvement. Okay, thank you. And Ms. Chappelle, you and Tony Lewis Jr. both talked about poverty and its relationship to violent crime. And it seems like we continue to have this vicious cycle where we have violent crime and then we have disinvestment in communities, um, which of course negatively impacts our kids and our families who are living there. Aside from violence intervention, where do you think we should be most effectively seeking to intervene to disrupt this cycle? Um, I think, you know, a lot can happen in schools. I think um, invest, making sure that, and I, and I know, and I haven't looked in detail at the budget for schools. I know one of the things that is supposed to be happening with the school budget is not having any reduction in any, mm -hmm. any Yes, um, school budget year over year, and making sure that that none of the, particularly none of the schools east of the river face any budget cuts. Making sure that they are well resourced. Making sure that um, that the you know the next generation gets the resources that they need. Um, making sure that they get the mental health support that they need. Um, making sure that we have um, that that east of the river has basic businesses that it needs that they have grocery stores that they have hospitals that you know all the things that have been that have been lacking there that we that everybody knows are lacking there and i think probably my neighbors that live east of the river can speak to to the investments that are that are needed there that are very basic okay thank you so much and yeah i'm especially concerned about our school budgets not being stable because we continue to see that disinvestment in mm -hmm. schools that are under enrolled and then receive less funding. And then as a result, they suffer from under enrollment. And, yeah. just, and Ward 8 has the largest number of school-aged children in, of any ward, um, but it has a lot of school children that are leaving to go to other other wards. And so, if we can build up the schools within that within that ward and and keep those kids there and have just you know keep um, reverse the cycle, you know, and make make Ward Eight a, a destination for for people. Yeah, thank you. And Mr. Lewis, I want to give you a chance to elaborate on that same question about how we can more effectively disrupt these cycles of um, poverty and interrupt violence and where you think those investments and interventions will be most successful. But I also want to ask you specifically about investing in our families and how we can reach adults um, and parents to give them supports, especially if uh, they have children who, because, in part because of a lack of opportunity, they may see going into a, a dangerous or unproductive path. Um, how can we invest and support those parents so that they can 
better support their own families. Okay. Um, thank you. First of all, let me say, uh, Reverend Judy, I, I sincerely apologize for now uh, for speaking while you were on when you were testifying. Um, you know, I really see this as a matter of um, really addressing our inability to to steal um, or expunge records here in the District of Columbia. Um, I, I really feel I know some things we can or potentially can, but um, I think we need to really look at here. Um, so many of the crimes that people go to prison for are violent in nature, right? And so uh, having a lot of those offenses not be eligible for sealing or expungement um, is something that, and given the, the uh, our growth industries of banking and finance, hospitality, IT, um, and healthcare, where so many of the jobs exist um, and, and, and putting limitations on where people can go, um, it, it, so again, us being able to, or this group of people being able to really get itself out of poverty uh, becomes uh, incredibly daunting uh, when you look at it from that perspective. And any industry or any job or, 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 or um, you know, sort of company that may hire people that have been touched by the criminal justice system, there's going to be an inevitable bottleneck. Right. So we need to sort of clear the pathway towards um, a lot of our growth industries in D.C. and build something that's really based on what we see and not sort of what's going on um, around the country. Um, and um, so so how does that relate to families and your question that you're asking? Um, I really feel like we see a young person that's engaged at any point in school, out of school, dealing with trouble. I think it should really uh, prompt us to look at that family, look at the adults around that kid. What are the needs? What are they going through? Um, and when we talk about, you know, a place like Ward A, where you talk about the lack of certain amenities and um, grocery stores and sit down restaurants not opening, but none of that stuff is going to occur really until the median income in that area rises. Um, in the neighborhood I live on Hanover Place, uh, like I said, right over for North Capitol next to O Street. Um, what I've seen in this community is um, even some of our schools went away. All of our public schools went away, really, um, because families can no longer, poor families can no longer live in this neighborhood. Um, enrollment went down, um, people moved, and our schools were divested and closed eventually. And I, and I hate to say this, but I feel like that's the same thing we're going to see east of the river. Um, and that's what we have. So in, in order to, for that not to happen, we have to, again, uh, connect those families with pathways to true economic opportunities. And what that is going to mean is we have to really carve out and say, we want this for this group of people. And an investment in that group of people is really an investment in every Washingtonian, particularly from um, the public safety lens. And I think our test scores will go up in schools. I mean, we'll see the effects of something like this all across the board. Okay, thank you for that. And in terms of expungement or record sealing, are you aware of any other state in the United States that goes further than DC does in this space? You know what? That's a great question. Not really. I mean, I think that, well, I know that Maryland and Virginia, you can expunge records, right? You can expunge things there that you can't expunge in DC, that it is an option. But like with us, we can't expunge any felonies, right? But I also think it's important to look at our job market. We have one of the most competitive and unique job markets in the country, right? Our growth industries are much different. We have a knowledge-based economy. And so when we talk about getting our residents um, you know, prepared and trained up, they still meet barriers because the, if they have criminal histories, they, they cannot easily matriculate into these spaces. So I feel like we really have to design something that fits us and what we face. The other thing, uh, Chairwoman, I'm not trying to go with my time, but we also have no autonomy over when people go and uh, when they're incarcerated, right? What kind of interventions they get. We're the only place outside of the Indian, uh, our native uh, reservations that have, uh, that have to do their time in the Federal Bureau of Prisons, right? So we're at a disadvantage there also. So we can't prepare people properly. Um, uh, you know, a recommendation I would have was to try to have people come back to the D.C. jail maybe a year and a half pre-release so that they can get, um, you know, sort of our interventions and get connected to services. I think the IRA uh, guys who came back before they went to court is a great example of how that can work. But all in all, I feel like we really I'm not saying not let's not look abroad or look outside the district. 
But I really think we have such a unique situation here that we have to build that in house, but we have to be bold. I know that, um, I don't know how Congress will feel about that, but if, and if we can't do that on the Hill, then I think we have to really convene uh, the business leaders, the, the Chamber of Commerce, uh, you know what I mean, the Board of Trade, all of these people that run the businesses here and say, hey, listen, this is a public safety issue. If we cannot connect our residents to uh, you know, opportunities, whether it's WMATA, whether it's Pepco, Washington Gas, whether it's uh, Hyatt and, 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 and uh, you know, Hilton or Marriott, I'm just giving that as an example. It's so much that's off the table, a med star and wash the hospitals and all that kind of stuff. People that I work with every day can't work there. And so when we start talking about hopelessness, because that's what we're dealing with, honestly, right? Hopelessness. That's why this violence is what it is, right? People have given up because they don't feel like it's opportunity, but they see everybody else around us having opportunity and thriving from a mental health standpoint, from, um, you know, uh, again, a, 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 a standpoint of me feeling like I belong, right? Um, it's difficult, right? And so that's what we have to address as a city collectively. And again, um, as I close, an investment in poor Black folks from Washington is an investment in every Washingtonian. Well, thank you so much. And a lot of really great ideas there and some of my shared frustration with our inability to control our own criminal justice system completely, because sometimes these are federal decisions that are affecting our residents. Um, I'm not sure if you heard, Mr. Lewis, some of the conversation on the previous panel, but we were talking uh, about domestic violence, homicides specifically, but also in access, too much readily access to guns. And one of the ideas that was shared was making sure that if somebody has a criminal history at all, um, especially with a violent crime, that they're not able to legally purchase a gun. How do you think we square that thinking to keep guns out of the hands of people with also the thinking of what you're talking about and giving people another chance and making sure that they can have hope to get employed and participate in our economy productively? Sure. Yes, I, I did. Uh, I heard the, the commentary in the earlier panel. I mean, I, I think if we looked at the data, um, most of the people, uh, most of the guns that are used in homicides are not uh, used by the legal owner. I'm not saying that that's, you know, people that have been, um, you know, had arrest or been, you know, uh, violent in some nature prior to should just have access to buying guns. But I think we don't really see though. That's not the person that's uh, shooting people, right? That's not what's happening. And typically it's the legal guns that are being utilized um, in, in, in uh, violence that we see. Um, so, so I'm not saying that we shouldn't address our gun laws and the one gun a month type of thing. I mean, but I don't know if that is the driver of the gun violence that we see in our community is, is all that I'm saying. I think DC, I mean, if you have a, if you got it, like I'm a Places, right? Sorry, Mr. Lewis, you're um, cutting up a I little think bit. What we have your video is going in now. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you guys? Can you hear me though? Can you hear no, me? No, I can. Can you hear me? You can hear me. All I was saying was I don't know if uh, legally buying guns, no matter what their history has been, are the people uh, is what's what we're seeing in community as far as gun violence. I think the violence that we're seeing in the community typically stems from illegal firearms, right? Um, I think I'm all for whatever protections people feel need to happen. I'm a legal gun owner and DC push you through a lot to get your firearm. You can't just walk in and walk out with a gun um, here. Um, and I think, but I, I feel like a lot of the violence that we see in the community um, is more associated with illegal firearms. And gun where traffic, people you know, are getting those illegal firearms? I mean, you got ghost guns, your guns are being purchased uh, on, on the black market. They're, they're, those aren't legal. The legal gun owners aren't the people, you know, that- But that, in terms that are, of, I know there's a lot of different sources, but in terms of people that you have worked with or heard from, what are some of those primary sources of access to illegal guns? Um, it's a black market. 
guns as, as much as you know. I guess it's, there's a black market. Guns are around. You know, guns is all. One thing about DCD, guns have always been easily accessed. Um, where those guns are coming from, I don't. I don't know, but they're they're here. And um, I think the type of gun or the access to uh, guns, high caliber guns, uh, high, high power, uh, high caliber uh, magazines. Um, I don't think guns have ever been as easily accessible as they are today. And uh, that's definitely an issue in our community. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, no problem. Reverend Shepard Gore, I want to ask you about this music challenge. And this has been something that we've been speaking a lot about during performance oversight with the ONES office and MPD and others on how we can both provide opportunities for young people in exploring their creativity and participating in music and also making sure that that's being done productively and not encouraging violence. Um, but some of the issues that we're seeing with social media and negative music and other diss tracks, have you seen kids who are engaging in unhealthy relationships who have then responded well to more positive engagement and kind of switch their tune? No pun intended. You, you know, yes and no. I mean, it does definitely take um, a lot of supervision and effort around showing them that, that they can get the same message across because a lot of the messaging is about disrespect, being feeling disrespected and not, you know, honored in their own space. They're not really connected to their neighborhoods in a very positive way because of the disinvestment in their neighborhoods, because of the things that they they see. So they're they're really talking about the things that that really are hurting them and this is their their way of reacting to it but one of the things that I wanted to create and it happened during the pandemic um, we had to find a creative way for committed youth to utilize their time while they were inside the facility and at home in the community while they were in their house so we came up with a social media idea that allowed them to express themselves poetically and through music, but the lyrics had to be positive. If anything, um, if we were going to uh, send anything um, to Piece of Art um, DC, who we collaborated with, they host every summer um, during Juneteenth, um, specifically uh, a cultural arts festival where there's art on display, there's rap music, and they're, you, you know, they're posting the videos on social media, but it's all in a very positive vein. And there's young people who are really doing it. And I think with the right type of education, around social media, um, our business model that was created um, from the young people who participated in the project really gave them an opportunity to see how they could become a part of a social media empire that they built right? They can see themselves as the, as the influencers, as the ad executives, as the people that are actually marketing their product, but just showing them a different avenue into that whole social media construct that doesn't have to be negative. You don't have to disrespect your neighborhood, your family, or your someone that you grew up with in kindergarten, who's now your op or your enemy. You can now look take yourself out of that space and become one of the producers and one of the executives. And here's how we do that. So educating them about the, the whole idea behind social media, giving them an opportunity to see themselves as one of the people that are employed as a result of it. And you don't need a college degree. You know, you just have to have a, the gift of gab and some talent and the genuine desire to want to promote yourself in a positive light. So we found that in showing them that they can do this, that here's an opportunity. And we've created a, a social media um, platform called Hood Social DC. We're, um, we're scheduling it to launch, hopefully by the end of the summer. We've um, partnered with Community Tech to actually do the app design and development, but the kids created their own app. And this was created Councilmember Pinto by DYRS kids that were committed, 
uh, at New Beginnings and in the community just locked in during the pandemic. And we got a huge, huge, uh, you know, um, positive feedback from doing it. And it's just that kind of momentum and that kind of funding uh, that we need to put out there. Because if we can bridge this great divide between the haves and the have nots um, and get more investment in those neighborhoods, I think one of the other panelists talked about the small concentration of violence uh, being committed by a small number of people. And, and that's true. That's very, very true. We see it in the neighborhoods that we serve through our VI programs and through our Credible Messenger initiatives. If we can get the attention of those individuals and really start to redirect some of that energy and prevent the ones that's coming behind them, that's watching them from doing so, I think we can do it. And I think the school is a major platform to do that, yeah. uh, which is why we're going, we're taking our message to the middle school and high schools in our areas. Well, thank you so much, Reverend. And thank you for that work. That is really powerful. And I I hope a great example of how we can kind of harness some of this positivity to get young people uh, the supports they need and, and help guide them in a, in a positive way. Um, Ms. Donnelly, I thank you so much for your work. And I want to um, ask you about some of the intervention programs that you talked about, how you have found the coordination with the DC government in, in your efforts. Um. So thank you again for having me. Um, it has, it is something I think a lot of programs have struggled with in recent years. Um, it has gotten significantly better with the new office for um, gun violence prevention. And I wanna thank the folks from that office who come to the uh, project change meetings. So um, project change is, is the overarching group of hospital-based violence intervention programs in the city. Um, and we have monthly meetings and now the Office of Gun Violence um, Prevention is also coming to those meetings and it's been incredibly helpful and we've definitely seen um, a, a, a change in the responsiveness. Um, I think we need more folks at the table, um, housing, education. Um, uh, we are interacting more and more with the ONES office, which is great, and uh, we need that to continue. Um, but I, I, I think break, continuing to break down those silos um, to be able to continue to share data, but also doing it in a way that is respectful of our clients um, because um, they also have their own in, uh, privacy and dignity that we need to respect. Um, is is important. So I think continuing to bolster those relationships and the communication will be really key. Okay, I hear you there. Definitely something we're focused on. Thank you. Thank you to everybody on this panel. Really appreciate a lot of great ideas that we're going to keep uh, moving forward on. Appreciate you. We are going to call our next panel uh, where we will hear from Rachel Usden from Peace for DC, Dr. Bruce Purnell from the Love More Movement, Sam Sandra Seegers from Concerned Residents Against Violence or CRAVE, Stuart Anderson from Family and Friends of Incarcerated People, and Raj, Public Witness. So whenever you are ready, uh, Rachel Usden from Peace for DC, please go ahead. Thank you and um, good afternoon, Chairperson Pinto and members of the council and staff. My name is Rachel Yuzian and I'm testifying today on behalf of Peace for DC. I appreciate opportunities like this for members of the community and advocates to speak, but I worry that we do too much talking all the while people are dying and becoming traumatized every day. I want to emphasize the urgency of this issue and the need to take action and not look backwards, but move forwards. I'm here to focus on the progress we've made and on concrete steps that we can take now to keep moving forward together. We must acknowledge the impressive number of programs that have been piloted and expanded in the past five years, including ones, the Cure the Streets program, the hospital-based violence intervention work, Safe Passage, and many more. We certainly have made progress, a meaningful foundation for violence intervention work in the district. And Peace for DC is here to work for and with the organizations leading DC's community violence intervention efforts, providing high quality programming to help these um, peacemakers achieve greater results through the Peace Academy, um, Stop the Bleed training, um, co-creating a professional code, cognitive behavioral theory classes, 
peace night guest speakers, peace room strategy meetings, advocacy, and issue awareness. So um, I encourage everyone to roll our sleeves up and take next steps. There are many things that meaningful steps that we can do to build a top of the groundwork we already have and make investments in our community violence intervention infrastructure that are investments in a safer city. A couple things that I would put on my list are that we will put on our list are um, that the violence intervention teams need to be adequately staffed. Uh, training at the DC Peace Academy should be mandatory, and that's a need that we're hearing from the CBI teams, not a request that we're initiating. Um, the CBI salaries and benefits need to be aligned and elevated to match the challenging nature of these jobs. VI sites need to be added in uncovered areas, especially those with active conflicts. The Pathways program needs to be extended to last longer and go deeper, ensuring higher rates of success for the graduates, because honestly, we're failing graduates who don't even have stable housing. Um, the ones and cure programs should be combined, as we've talked about for years now, uh, ensuring that the final product is held to a high standard and follows a proven model for BI work. We need to train all of the CBI workers in a program like ROCA Impacts Cognitive Behavioral Theory um, and enroll them in our ongoing community of practice so they can really utilize these life-saving skills to heal trauma. We need to require that all of the CBOs that receive government grants and contracts related to violence prevention and intervention attend regular partner meetings to share information and report out on programs and available services. That was from the uh, Nick Jr. strategic plan, as well as this last one to launch uh, credible messengers for all initiative to ensure that every youth and adult being released from custody in the district is paired with a credible messenger prior to release. <clears throat> now let's talk about resources. DC has a wealth of resources in government and community, but we have an access problem. People cannot access the resources. And the individuals who are in crisis, who are most likely to be shot or be a shooter are furthest from the access. So let's focus on next steps and how to solve this. The answer to the access problem is having intermediaries. They have to be people who are trusted, which most often means they have credible lived experience and meaningful connections to the communities they are serving. This is not a referral or a warm handoff. This is walking literally and figuratively with a participant on a daily basis for potentially several years with relentless engagement and encouragement. This is life coaching. The government should be empowering, training, and funding individuals and organizations in the community to do this work. They should be able to have great flexibility and access to whatever resources are deemed the most effective. The more restrictions the government puts on these programs, the harder it is to make them work. These life coaches need to work directly with the CDI workers who are the first and often most important contact for each participant. Resources should be based around neighborhood hubs because a lot of times people who are afraid of getting shot are not going to leave their neighborhood. And by resources, we're talking about wraparound, holistic, all in one place, no wrong do door care. Finally, there are 85 days until Memorial Day weekend. I'd like to know what everyone's plan is for creating peace this summer. How are we coordinating efforts? The DPR programming and summer youth employment are excellent, but we need to think outside the box and go beyond. We need all hands on deck in government and community. Let's saturate the neighborhoods with pro-social protective factor activities Children, teens, and adults who are busy having fun, who are fed, clothed, and housed are less likely to be drawn to carjackings and shootings. We have the resources to do this. Finally, the best models that have worked in other cities and the past in DC are the ones that are evidence-based and community-led. We need to build up the skills and capacity of DC's brave CBI workforce and empower them to bring about the peace that we all so desperately want. Thank you for listening to our testimony. Thank you so much, Ms. Suzanne. <clears throat> we will next hear from Dr. Bruce Purnell from the Love More Movement. Right. Love More, good afternoon, Chair Professor Pinto, committee members and staff. Thank you for allowing me to speak with you today about gun violence, prevention, intervention, and recovery. I'm Dr. Bruce Purnell, the founder and executive director of the Love More Movement. We're a grassroots community-based nonprofit with a mission to facilitate holistic healing platforms, brave spaces, and life coaching, healing leadership training certification for survivors of past trauma, their families, and their communities to heal and recover from trauma, emotional pain, and toxic stress. I'm a sixth generation Washingtonian with DC roots going back to the 1830s and a descendant of Underground Railroad station masters and conductors. 
I could tell you countless stories of resilience, healing, and transformation as we survived numerous situations of historical trauma and terrorism for just being Black in America. I want to emphasize that it's essential to understand history to make sense of the present. Today, discussing gun violence reduction and prevention, I'm led to start with a historical discussion involving the anatomy of a culture of historical trauma and violence in DC and a search for historical culture and healing and reconciliation, which we miss sometimes. In my lifetime, using music as a medium of culture, I have seen us move from soul to trap. When I was young, we called each other soul brothers and soul sisters, listen to soul music, ate soul food, watched soul train and celebrated parties with having a soul train line. The importance of that history connects with an attachment of spirit to culture as a universal label. Because of the soul label, it wouldn't be so consciously easy to kill a soul brother or violate a soul sister. Whereas there's a different energy connected to the labels of ends, bees, and dogs. The very title of soul produces a contradiction and cognitive dissonance when, when uh, connected to self-inflicted and or perpetrated violence. Remember that the soul connects to spirit and spirit connects in many ways to holistic healing. I will also state here that the era that we call the war on drugs, which was also the crack era, was the beginning of a narrative of gun violence in Washington, D.C. Many understand that the war on drugs was a war against black and brown people. Ground Zero was the most underloved communities experienced the highest frequency of gun violence today. And that during this uh, era, we adopted a new narrative lenses and a language that uh, fit what we were seeing and feeling. From the trauma-informed language, what happened to us is that we were drugged. And if the same kind of care went into the crack epidemic as with the opioid crisis, we wouldn't be having this round table today. Once we understand that historical and cultural foundation of healing and violence, the bigger question involves solutions. And I stress that there are no solutions that don't include healing from past trauma. From a CPT perspective, we must develop new lenses to examine ourselves, our families, and our communities. We got here by design and hate. We must solve this by design and love. We must heal, forgive, and love our way out of this dilemma. For moving forward with any methodology to reduce or prevent gun violence, we must heal. The love more conversation starts with healing circles and continues with the understanding that because love is perpetual, there is no end. Our participants become members of the Love More family, which includes healing stations, home base with a brave, affirming, secure environments, the transformative life coaches and healing leaders, seniors offering unconditional love, which is our soul, and the overground freeway. The Love More movement has been engaged in healing and transformation building within the trenches of underloved communities in Washington, D.C. for over 20 years. We embrace original concepts of a liberated identity and new narratives where oppressed peoples have the opportunity to heal from past trauma, pursue happiness without restraint, and expect the mental state of love, light, joy, hope, peace, purpose, liberation, and transformation. The Love More Movement's mission involves training transforming life coaches and healing leaders and building brave spaces called healing stations where trauma survivors can heal without judgment, filter, and within their respective communities. Transformative life coaches, healing leaders, and healing stations align with the most innovative approaches to providing holistic mental health support to survivors of historical, institutional, and many other forms of trauma. The Love More team has intensely created brave spaces for survivors to discover that they are valuable enough to love and be loved and to know that atoning, forgiving, healing, growing, thriving, loving, and transforming are real possibilities. In closing, we believe that love wins. And there is no way to suppress the behavior of violence without addressing the emotion that's causing that behavior. And one more time, we cannot suppress the behavior of violence without addressing the emotion that's causing the behavior. We are coming out of a three-year pandemic and, can, and we have the opportunity to re reintroduce ourselves, however we choose. Let's choose love, joy, transformation, health, friendship, forgiveness, friends, and keeping DC families together. I want to thank OVSJG for providing a platform for us to build a brave healing space and start a healing movement and start a terrorist. Uh, CFSA for unpre unprecedented partnership. Together we rise for always being family and love and healing. Our sister organization, The Wire, the Peace Academy, and an array of community and national partners. My family at the Alliance, Rest in Purpose, Brother Rico, and my coach, mentor, and friend, Mama Karen Suttles, for always believing in the best parts of ourselves and keeping us grounded in the bigger picture. Thank you. I'm open to any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Cornell. I love that. Uh, next, we will hear from Sandra Seegers from the Concerned Residents Against Violence. Good afternoon um, to everyone and you too, Councilmember Pinto. It's good seeing you again. You I'm well Sandra, coming back. Uh, yep. Um, I'm Sandra S.S. Seegers, a Ward 8 resident, <clears throat> a member of CRAVE, which is Concerned Residents Against Violence, 
and a member of the Eastern River Public Safety Consortium. Cray's main concern is violent crime prevention and intervention. Hold the gun industry accountable for illegal guns, especially the ones used in homicides. By all means, rewrite the revised criminal code because it, as long as they get short or no time, I mean, short time or no time, they will continue to commit crimes. Apply for funding to support communities. One federal fund is the Bureau of Justice Assistance. The U.S. Department of Justice Bureau of Justice Assistance offers funding for states and localities to support a range of public safety initiatives. This would be one of the hiring more, this would be one to hire more violent interrupters. Uh, and they said that the, um, the fund is underutilized. The OG's Cure the Streets program should be duplicated at the one's office. In the areas where, o, where the OAG has violence interrupters, the crime rate has decreased. Uh, yeah, the crime rate has decreased. Bellevue, Trenton Park, Waller Place, Washington Highland. If you can duplicate this in other areas with consistency, crime should decrease. And the formula they use, uh, they have five areas with four organizations. Each area have three to six violence interrupters, two to four outreach workers, one program manager, one administrative assistant, one site supervisor, and one director of operations for each organization. Another fund is the Victims Crime Act. This funds the, uh, th these funds are designed to compensate, I lost my spot. Uh, da, da, da. Oh yeah, is another um, this the law the federal law is the uh, wait a minute, hold on I'm trying to read off this computer hold on uh, okay here we go another fund is the Victim Crimes Act this funds and is and is designed to compensate victims of violence and to fund organizations that provide assistance to victims prosecute all gun charges in federal court to get to get repeat gun violence offenders off the streets. The federal law is the Armed Career Criminal Act. It's another federal gun law that requires a 15 year mandatory minimum sentence for anyone who possesses a gun or ammunition and also has three, have three prior convictions for drug trafficking or violent felonies. The mandatory minimum applies even if the prior convictions are old, nonviolent, minor, resulted from a drug addiction or resulted in no prison time. Currently, there is a no safe file for any federal gun crimes. And a safety uh, a safety file is an exception to mandatory minimum sentencing laws. A safety file allows a judge to sentence a person below the mandatory minimum term if certain conditions are met. So there's no safety file. To respond to uh, early witnesses, I'm in Ward 8. Crime in Ward 8 is deterring businesses from coming here. If I were to open a business, I would not open it in Ward 8 at this time. We lost two 7-Elevens and a Walgreens. As long as we have no loitering laws, the crowds will stay in front of the businesses. Another problem is that many of the residents and, and the council member think selfishly. They think because they cannot afford certain things that they should not come to Ward 8. And that is backward thinking. They complain about a hotel. They complain about Starbucks. And of course, we can't afford everything to come. If I could afford everything, I'm good. But if you all did not have the things that I couldn't afford, the whole city would probably shut down. Because right now, I couldn't even afford to buy a house made of toilet paper. So we can't think of just people that's low income or no income with, you know, on public assistance. So we got to think for everybody. We need the low income, the mid middle income, and the rich. We need all of that, and we need that to come to Ward 8. But until we stop the crime, it's not going to happen that fast. And thank you so much. I have 22 minutes left. And with that, I'm going to say, hey, Stuart, you got the email. Thanks for coming on. And I'm finished. <laughs> thank you so much. You and I think it's a really important point. Um, and so much of the other priorities that folks are focused on in the city really, I believe, will not be advanced until we get a handle on our public safety concerns. Yes. Thank you. Uh, next, we will hear from Stuart Anderson from Family and Friends of Incarcerated People. 
Hey, Sandra, I trust that you yielded those uh, minutes to me, right? Because um, I could use them. I'm about to be on my soapbox. First and foremost, um, to this Judiciary Committee and uh, those council members present, I probably will say this again, because I'm going to just read through this piece and just try to share these notes as cognizant as I can and as clearly as I can. But thank you, uh, council members. Uh, both, I, I only can see the two of you, and that's uh, Councilmember Pinto and, and Nadeau. And so for those who, who, who are also maybe listening in, thank you as well. I come before this public round table on the issues related to violence in general and gun violence specifically. Um, I've just thanked the both of you. I thank you again for hosting it. Hopefully this will not fall on deaf ears. Yesterday, I stood with other concerned citizens of our city in the parking lot of Safeway in Southeast. Safeway. Wow, Safeway. I was there because I cannot be silent when innocent, law abiding citizens are being gunned down in our communities, both the elderly and children and others. We must come together to implement solutions to address the chaos that we see here and witness happening around us. Let me first say, I wanna also thank the mayor, Mayor Bowser and her staff for their efforts to address the gun violence in our city by creating the ones up. I love the idea that they pushed some of this stuff together. Uh, Reverend Motley and I and a few others, you know, we created this idea of First Fridays, we just came out of that meeting earlier, but First Friday was an effort to do just that, to pull together everybody who's focusing on this violence so that we might work together, share information, share best practices. These are the things that I see as a, as, as, as a problem with our addressment. That's just one addressment, right? Many of those who, 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 who testified before me have spoken about a lot of this different work and, and how this stuff needs to be linked together. The key is linking it together, that each of these different departments and agencies that are working on stuff, they have to be communicating with each other. Um, I, 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 it, it's kind of difficult you know, to manage and maintain public safety. I know it too, too well. You know, I deal with it every day to provide protection for over 720,000 people is huge. And so that's why I thank the mayor for her efforts and the council for what it's doing. My name's Stuart Anderson. I am the eldest son of a single parent who struggled to raise five children in this lovely city. Yes, I'm, I'm a native Washingtonian. I currently live east of the Anacostia River. So I live in probably what we call the war zone. I have the distinct pleasure of having been educated in the DC public school system. I have the honor of having graduated from the University of the District of Columbia for which I am, have a bachelor's degree in urban studies. I mention these things merely to those listening can get an understanding of the fact that I'm a, I'm a product of Washington DC. I know the streets, I know what's happening there on the concrete in some of our crevices where some of this mess is taking place. For the last few years, I have been the director, the community engagement director for the Anacostia Coordinating Council, ACC. I also serve as a Ward 8 committee man with the Democratic State Committee, not to mention the fact that I am the director, founding director for family and friends of incarcerated people. Why is that all important? I too am a returning citizen. So I wanna, I, I, I wanna lay that out there and come there so you understand that the problem is not returning citizens generically. So thank you, uh, Tony Lewis Jr. for all of what you did in advocating for returning citizens. I will not do that here. We must get in front of the violence. Housing insecurity, joblessness, and a host of other inequalities make the behavioral issue compounded. So we gotta figure out how do we get in front of it? We got great schools. What, what, what I participate in yesterday was a response to violence. And that's good. We gotta respond to violence when it happens. 
And that has, and that has been how all of us have been approaching this problem. Many of us, let me say many of us, I'm not going to say all of us, let me say many of us, right? We've approached it from a response to violence. The violence interruptors are going to come in when violence takes place. The police are going to do what they do. So more police, I'm not against more police. I'm not about defunding the police. I'm about reallocating the funding that police the police department receives. And so, yes, we should hire some more police. I just came from Mexico and I seen police, ain't none of them had guns. I was amazed, no crime taking place. We, 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 we can put more money in our schools and we should put more money in our schools. But we gotta figure out what happens when our children, when they leave, right? We can continue to payroll the violence interrupters, the credible messages, the safe passage workers and everything. But if we don't train them, as the young lady said in the earlier panel, they got to be trained. The police need some de-escalation training beyond what they are doing now. And definitely all of these violence intervention teams should be at least interacting with one another. And they all have to be better trained. That's just my two cents for it. I've had these conversations with our new attorney general. I'll have them with anyone who will listen. We must help people heal from the trauma. See, we don't help people heal from the trauma. Everything else we do is a Band-Aid waiting for the next incident so that we can come out and have a vigil or a press conference about the atrocity of violence. We have okay, to, I'm getting close to my time, right? You're, but, you're quite over your time, so I'm gonna ask you to wrap up, but I will come back to you for questions. Certainly. So let me say a final thought, right, is this, right? On music, we have to do some positive stuff to push our young people to do the period, because what we hear is what we do. And only love can drive out hate. And the last thing is, our children need some communication skills. And I heard some of that earlier. We have to figure out how we get them to talk to each other better. I thank you for hearing my testimony. Thank you so, so much for allowing me to go over time. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Uh, we will next hear and last on this panel from Raj, public witness. Hi there, my name is Raj. I uh, live in Ward 7 and I just have a few questions, comments, and suggestions. Uh, DC in the past had much stricter uh, gun laws and it never affected crime. So why do we think laws are going to solve any of these uh, gun gun laws. A couple suggestions. I would I would offer putting government mandated birth control for men on the table or universal basic income. While I don't think money is the solution, we have a $20 billion budget. If it if it would were the solution, we would have solved it by now. Um, I feel like incarceration works better than decriminalizing and legalizing everything. It's not a it's not a fun thing to talk about. It's not going to get me any virtue signaling points to consider incarceration. I live in Ward Seven every day, and whatever the council is doing, it's obvious it's not working. It's an embarrassment to other cities. There is no wealthier, more violent city in the USA than Washington, D.C., okay? And you can look it up. Um, Ward 7 and 8 are not replacements for prisons, okay? Brooke, you can sit there in Georgetown and pass all the laws you want. They're not going to affect you as much. You can just dump it into Ward 7 and 8, like all the environmental issues are dumped here. I get it, man. It's easier to to talk the talk than walk the walk. Um, another thing I've learned, and, I, and I'm, I'm talking from my perspective, if, if murder is God's will, can it be that bad? You know, I've heard people say, oh, God is, it, God is in charge. Okay, then let, let murder be normal as it is. Think about that for a second, because it's not me that, that's pulling the trigger. It's, it's people who may think like that. And I'm just like maybe we need to rethink our whole priority of what is right and wrong with that. So think about that one for a second. Um, the other thing is, is I feel like it's not poverty, it's culture. I've been to meetings, I hear guys talk about needing this and that, and I look at them and they have Montclair jackets and Fendi sneakers. And I had to Google that. And I was like, wow, that's a $1,500 jacket and $500 sneakers. I was like, I'm not learning anything about poverty here. It's about culture. 
And Brooke, the last thing I want to tell you, man, I'm not here to ask you for money. I'm, I don't represent any organization. I don't want your funds. I want your courage to do the right thing, man. We, we don't have the courage to, to look people in the eye and say, hey, man, DC can't afford you no more. So I'll end with that. Talking about culture, I'll respect your time. That is my culture. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. And I think um, to your point, Raj, about listening to voices where we're here seeing the most disproportionate impact of violence, some of my strongest partners in this work have been the Ward 7 council member, Vince Gray, and the Ward 8 council member, Treyon White, who have been calling for more help and who have been sounding the alarm for years that this violence cannot be normalized. Um, and I agree with them on that and agree that that what we're doing is not working. Um, Ms. Yuzdan, I want to ask you to respond to some of what we've heard um, around the immediacy. I hear you and you've done excellent work in highlighting some of the long-term interventions that we really need to be focused on to more effectively interrupt these cycles of violence. But what do you say to victims of violence that happen today or tomorrow in responding to that accordingly and making sure that there are meaningful um, penalties associated with that and ensuring that people are removed from situations where they could continue being violent or they themselves can become victims of violence, which is what we also continue to see when people are um, returned back without, without necessary kind of interventions or penalties. Well, while some of the programs I mentioned, they take time to grow and mature, intervention is still the fastest way to see results, faster than prevention and neighborhood transformation, and more effective than just policing. Policing has a role and we need to hold people accountable, but you know the closure rate is only so high. And that means there's a certain number of people who are not, um, you know, or who are still uh, in the neighborhood and still potentially, um, you know, at dangerous. And the best way to reach those individuals is through credible neighborhood-based intervention efforts. People who know who is pulling the trigger and know how to conv convince them to put their guns down and help them find a different path. So the um, timeline for intervention work is the fastest and most effective method. And the steps that I described are next steps for us to take that work to the next level and make it more effective. Does that answer your question? Um, yes, mostly. And Mr. Anderson, can you I'll, I'll just add, that's not to say prevention and addressing root causes and addressing poverty are not also very, very important. They just have a longer timeline. Sorry. Thank you. Mr. Anderson, can you chime in here? What do you think about this distinction between what I would describe as longer term inventions, interventions, even though I, I hear you misused and that intervention can be fast in theory um, between some of these investments that may take longer to see in our community versus the you know hot spots and areas that we're seeing the most violence today to make sure that that does not happen tomorrow how do we get that balance right so let me let me say that a number of people have, have spoken in the past so mr anderson it's a little bit hard to hear you i'm not sure if okay. your volume is <clears throat> so I try. I'll be trying to like you know tone it down, right? Because sometimes they be saying I'm a little too aggressive, right? But the idea is that we didn't get where we are as it relates to the incidents and episodes that we are seeing in our community overnight. We we just did, right? And so if you believe that we can turn a switch and fix it, that we can relocate some people and we good. 
No, yes, it is a culture. It is a culture that has been driven. And, and I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, um, I'm Martin Knight. I'm a Martin Knight, right? So everybody knows I do the annual Martin Luther King Peace Walk and the Parade. Most people think it's just a celebration. No, it's about trying to take these ideas and get them into the minds and the hearts of people so that they live them out. It takes time to do that. It takes time to take a traumatized family and make it semi-whole. It takes a lot of time to do that. You got to make sure, because like we got some great teachers, both in the charter system. I don't like charter schools, but in the charter system and DCPS. Those children are being taught to the extent that those teachers are able, and then they go home to these atrocious homes that is, that is, that is, that is churning this stuff up. <clears throat> And so we gotta be able to how, figure out how do we make them whole? How do we make these families whole? And it takes time. And, and we can't think that it's gonna be fixed overnight. Yes, we can increase the penalties, but DC has got some of the harshest penalties in this country. If you start looking, I, I commend the work that y'all did around, you know, kind of get us up the code and everything. You know, the mayor had her opinion. I don't totally agree with all of that, but the idea is that we have to realize that this stuff has grown out of something. It's not just some bad people. It's some people who have become bad because of life circumstances. And we got to figure out, I love the idea of maybe universal income, right? But I also believe this, that we have to stop pacifying people who don't want to do better, right? So if I give you public assistance, you got to give me something. You got to go to this parenting class because every time you miss a parenting class, you get a little less money, right? And we get to one point where you lose your children because you're not going to be able to choose so sustain taking care of those kids anyway. And we need to put them in a more conducive environment so that they become different than those that we're seeing right now today. And I'm not blaming the children. I'm not blaming the parents. I'm talking. I'm talking. I mentioned that I got this degree in urban studies. I'm talking from that perspective that we have got to look at this situation. We got to break it down into its parts. We got to tinker with every level of it. And yes, we need to also make sure that people feel safe because it's a feeling. If I don't feel safe, I need a gun. Now, where those guns come from? As Mr. Lewis said earlier, I can't fathom it. That's one of the best. I can't fight the National you know, Rights Association and all of that, but we got to do something about these guns. Um, Access creates- Hopefully we can fight the National Rifle Association together. <laughs> um, know, access does it, you know? If we can get rid of some of that access, right? You know what I mean? To these guns. Yeah, I mean, they told me the guns up, up there the same way where they, where they were shooting and shot the woman in her back. You know, they was like, man, I don't need, I've never heard that before. And I'm like, yeah, I hear, you know, every now and then, because I live right on Stanton Road. We got to figure out how do we get the guns? And, 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 and Chief Conti has done some good things in terms of the incentive program, things like that. We got to start trying to, we got to put more cameras on the street. That's what I said we invest in, more cameras on the street, right? So that we can see and catch some of these cats that's bringing in these trunk load of guns because those individuals are creating the situation where people who are afraid, young people who are afraid, you know, not all young people though, they are afraid. I talked to them, you see, you see what's behind me, right? A bunch of young people, my little screen back there. I work with them every day and talk about this stuff and they honest with me because they know I ain't just trying to turn them into the law. I'm trying to help them do something different. And the key thing is, they got the gun because they're afraid. You shot at me, I'm shooting at you. So we can get the guns out of their hands. We got to have more intervention in the front. But it's going to take time, uh, uh, Miss Judas. You dad? Use dad. Help me out, y'all. Use on, dad. Well. Use dad. Okay. But that's what we got to right. do. And it's going to take time. Thank you. And Dr. Purnell or Raj or Ms. Seegers, do any of you have a response or ideas that were just raised, especially around the um, kind of working with the whole family unit, especially with government assistance to kind of 
encourage and or require that there be more kind of buy-in to some of these programs because we have a lot of work to do to address our economic disparities in DC, absolutely. And we also have a lot of government programs that go on in DC that are not utilized by everybody for whom they're available. Um, do either of you, any of you have responses to some of those ideas shared? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take a, a crack at it. When you have a home, you have a mother and a father there. It, it, it kind of doesn't matter sometimes if the child is easily led because they leave the house, they're doing something else. So peer pressure is much stronger than parent pressure because the parent's not gonna shoot you and kill you, but your friends will. So you try to fit in or get in where you fit in. And I think the main thing that's gonna stop crime is criminals. We can do all we want. If the criminals want to be a criminal, they're gonna be a criminal. So criminals stop crime. So I think the family, uh, uh, I think Stuart was talking about the parenting classes, but even with that, if the child or the teenager or whatever the, the, the age, if they don't buy into it, it's not going to work. They go out there with their friends. And it's not like we can we can lift a child, a good child, just take them, lift them up in a helicopter and, and take them over top of all these bad people. That's not going to happen. He, has, he or she has to walk through them. And at some point, they're going to maybe just fall in. And it's easier, it seems like it's easier to fall into a bad crowd than a good crowd. You don't see them run out there. One person goes to church. How many are going to follow that person? None. Somebody robs a bank, sell drugs. How many are going to follow that person? All the rest of them. So criminals stop crime and, and there's peer pressure. Uh, I'll say like one thing. I, um, sometimes I think we ask the wrong questions because there's just pressure to suppress the behavior. So, and you're not going to, you can't really suppress a behavior that's coming from an emotion that's it, it, it's, it's been going on for, 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 for a long time and it's actually even promoted. You know, the behavior that we don't want is promoted. And we asked also, like say, for example, uh, we asked a group of people like, you know, in raising our children to say retaliate against the bullying. Bullying is gonna happen. Like we had a culture where, you know, you, you're not gonna come through DC and not experience bullying. So you say, okay, we, we train our children to retaliate against the bully. Then you say, uh, well, now the bully has a gun. What do what what would naturally the children do? And we have to understand, like, what are we what are we saying here? And so the first question should be: do we have shared intentions? Before we talk about anything else, do we have shared intentions? And how do we get how do we get to that point where we all we all decide that we want to move this way? Then is it real? Because like, uh, would I sacrifice the present for a future that I don't believe in? And so I'm not going to jump through these hoops if I don't believe that, you know, I'm going to come out flying on the other side. So we have to, uh, we're asking for A, B, C, and D. We have to ensure E, F, and G is going to happen when somebody goes through this process. And I'm finding that more like families, like for example, um, the CFSA right now, the shift to, um, a, a wellness system versus a welfare system and the idea of keeping DC families together. So now we're gonna put resources into protecting the family versus punishing for those who need help, that kind of piece, right? We gotta look at this differently. Like if we really are investing in the families, like we show that we can invest in structure. We can look at an area that was low income and public housing and see condos. So we can, we can see that, but do we see that in the people? We have to really like take time out and see like, you know, how are we looking at this? And families don't want violence. Children don't want to, uh, even though it's promoted, they don't want to feel unsafe. Parents don't want to, they, they don't want to be in that condition. So everybody wants something different. We don't know how to get there. And like Stuart was saying earlier, people are scared. Some children, like if, again, the bully has a gun, I might have a gun just to protect myself because I don't want, I don't want to be a, a victim of this piece. So we're talking about changing the culture. Is it going to take a little while? Yeah. Because we have to infuse, and that's what I say, we got to love our way out of it. We have to infuse a culture of love and caring and hope and things into, in, into, this, into this system. We can't just uh, act like uh, hopelessness doesn't exist and think people are just going to buy in because you say, okay, uh, we're going to support you. Well, I don't know what that means. Um, you, I tell you my story. 
and you send me into the same condition that I was in as a child, I don't think that you, I don't think you understand this and, and support me. If you know this is happening to me every day, how do you send me back here? And then how does this really change for me? So, I, I, you know, in, in that families are buy in if they know that it's real. And that means we all, we got to drop our titles and kind of come to the table together for, with a shared intention of what we want. And, and I think that's at the beginning, but just know that we're not going to suppress a behavior without dealing with the emotion that's causing the behavior. And that's what we're trying to do. We put a lot of resources in if we're going to stop the headlines. And, you know, it, it's, not, it's not even realistic to think that that's ever going to work. Thank you. If, if I could... If I could just add, uh, as far as uh, structures uh, to address Brooke's question, if we're going to take the approach of uh, using social workers instead of police officers, imagine having a, a social worker station uh, in the appropriate areas. DC is a very small place. It's no mystery where things are happening. Does, you don't have to go far to, to find it. Um, imagine having small kiosks in, in the appropriate neighborhoods where there is some type of uh, hopefully relief when things uh, pop off and it's not relief that's going to add more violence to the situation. I, I just feel like if we are going to commit to that, I'm talking 50,000 social workers dispersed throughout uh, DC. Again, it's a small place. That's what it's gonna take um, because w there are families that it's no, you know, culture dominates everything and it, it may not even be seen as violent, you know, some of the things that happen. And maybe it takes someone, I don't know if that's right, someone from Northwest to say, hey, that's not right. You shouldn't do that. Well, who are you to say, this person shouldn't solve their own problems. And I think that's what it comes down to, how, how people solve their problems and does government have the right to tell them how to do it? I don't know, so. Can I just add one other thing? Sure. Uh, just going back to the original question about that you were asking me about the speed of intervention. And I just wanted to highlight Ms. Seegers here who is living with Beckham violence you know, every day, and she is asking for more violence intervention workers in her neighborhood. So, I mean, she knows better than I do. And it, I'm all for getting the guns, but it's, it's just a band-aid, you know? I mean, if you, when you peel back the layers of why someone's using a gun to begin with, it, there's many things at the root, but there's always trauma at the root. And so until we deal with that trauma, um, you know, it, it's not gonna get better. Um, people aren't born bad, like Mr. Anderson said. They've dealt with a lot of things that have made them become this way. Um, and we don't need to reinvent the wheel. There's a lot of people doing amazing work who can address trauma. And Dr. Purnell is, is one of them. There's many others in the community. Um, the ROCA model is amazing. They have seven simple flashcards. It's custom made for violence intervention workers to use in the community, on the street, anywhere. So you don't have to get an appointment and sit with a therapist and feel uncomfortable or whatever. It's very um, user-friendly and, you know, like, like it, it, it will take time, but I think it's important that we include efforts like that. Bless you. Yeah. Bless you. Can, I say one, can I say one statement, just, just, just one sentence too, like, what if this, so what if piece, like, what if, or would it change if we view the people as the medicine versus, versus the patient? would that change the way that we looking at all of this and the way that our investment flowed? Okay, well, thank you all. I think a lot of really good ideas and food for thought was shared. I will just say, I, I do believe that law enforcement is a part of the solution. I think that we need to do much more to address the trauma and uh, work with people. I like that concept, Dr. Purnell, of, of people as medicine. I think that's really powerful. And I also believe that when those interventions are unsuccessful and there are people dying in our city at the hands of guns and other people, we have to act. And I, I think that law enforcement 
and prosecutions and our court system are a part of that. They are not uh, going to solve all these challenges, but they are an important part of this. And I just want to make that clear. Um, but I look forward to, to working with all of you um, as we move forward. Um, we are going to move on to our next panel where we will hear from Christopher Saintville from Project Orange, Raisa Martinez from the Meditation Center at the ARC, Howard Garrett from DC Young Democrats, Kelvin Brown from ANC 7B, and Aaron Hall, MedStar Washington Hospital Center Community Violence Intervention Program. And if you are ready, we will get started with Christopher St. Bill from Project Orange. Good um, good afternoon and thank you, Chick. Am I on? Do y'all hear me? Okay, there I go. All right. Thank you um to Chairperson Pinto and Council Member Nato for this opportunity to testify about gun violence and advocate on behalf of gun violence intervention programs in DC. My name is Chris St. Will, and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Buffalo School of Social Work. I've had the honor of serving as the evaluation partner for Project Change during the Supporting Male Survivors of Violence Demonstration Project that was funded by the Office of Victim, of Sur Office of Victim Services and Justice Grants. So what I want to do with my time is just highlight a few of the findings from the demonstration project that took place um, at MedStar and Howard. First, our data from the demonstration project suggests that hospital-based violence intervention programs are having a positive impact on victims of violence in D.C. Specifically, our data suggests that the effect of the services provided are concentrated within the first three to six months of the program with contact across that, with, with the contact happening across a three to six month span, a man, amounting to about 10 to 20 hours of interaction between the program and participants. So this is a welcome finding given the criticisms lodged at the program. So the way the program works is not linear, but non-linear, suggesting more of a touch and go approach that takes on more of a sporadic nature than a structured clinical or helping relationship that we tend to look for. Second, the data suggests that most of the work conducted by hospital-based violence intervention programs assist individual victims of violence and their families. Their intervention, the intervention from HB VIPs are micro in nature. So as a result, the criticisms lodged at um, hospital-based violence intervention programs for not making impacts on the societal level of gun violence are misplaced because you cannot solve a macro level issue with a micro level intervention. Hospital based violence intervention programs do work, but the search for outcomes must be among the individual victims and their families, not in reductions in the, side, in the societal levels of gun violence. So ultimately, I am suggesting that there must be a reframing of what the programs are actually capable of doing and what they are actually doing out there in the communities. Lastly, um, as council member Nadeau suggested, violence interrupters and credible messengers have been worth their weight in gold to this issue. Many of the victims and program participants ended up engaging in the uptake of services because of having either a personal or collateral relationship with a credible messenger or violence interrupter. So patients have outlined in specific ways through this research, they have outlined specific ways in how the credible messengers motivated them to engage in services that ultimately led them to achieve positive outcomes. So credible messages are a crucial tool um, to the district and other cities around the country in dealing with the issues of everyday gun violence. So in closing, what I want to do is just give three suggestions that are based on what I just said. First, one way of complementing this three to six month long relationship in terms of like the sort of dosage that HBVs work with um, in terms of the victims. It is through it. We, we need to expand funding for um, crime victim compensation and remove barriers, especially from black male victims who, who experience stigma from law enforcement um, and help them expand that access so that they can benefit from the victim compensation fund. This benefit will assist them in being stabilized so that HB VIS will be able to um, spend more time building rapport um, and conducting their work and reducing the likelihood and risk that lead the persons who experience subsequent episodes of violence. Second, public discourse around HB VIPs and CVI programs have to change and be refrained. Because macro rates of gun violence do not decrease, that is not an indicator of the failure of these programs. 
While the causes of gun violence are many, and we know that, there is an effort on behalf of some to represent HB VIPs as a panacea that does not work, which is misplaced. The true metric is the impact on the lives of individu individual victims and their families. We cannot use macro levels of gun violence as a metric for whether or not these programs work. And then lastly, our research suggests that societal and human resource barriers to adequately compensate incredible messengers are an obstacle to sustaining them as well um, as an attack on their morale. I echo the voice of Michelle Chappelle and Rachel Usden in arguing that credible messengers, credible messengers deserve to be compensated for their expertise and experience, as well as hazard pay, given the dangerous situations that they work in, and they need support through training and technical assistance to do their job better, more effectively, and for further develop this role um, in this position as a career pathway. Um, thank you very much for my time, and I yield. Thank you very much, Mr. St. Bill. We will next hear from Raisa Martinez from the Meditation Center at the Ark. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, first, I also want to say, holy cow, for everyone sitting through a very long day. There's been so many great uh, recommendations, so many great um, ideas shared about how to reduce gun violence prevent, uh, and prevent it in the future. And I'm honored to be here with you all today. So thank you for my time. Um, I'm here to testify on behalf of the Meditation Center. We are located at the ARC and we are a division of the David Lynch Foundation. My name is Raisa Martinez and I'm the director of our center. We are based in Ward 8 on the ARC campus right here on Mississippi Avenue. For the past five years, the Meditation Center has collaborated with many other Ward 7 and Ward 8 organizations to address the twin epidemics of toxic stress and trauma that we feel are contributing significantly to gun violence in the district. We do this by bringing the evidence-based technique of transcendental meditation, referred to as TM, to Ward 7 and Ward 8 residents and other DC residents who are impacted uh, by violence in the city. Uh, we do this by focusing on folks who uh, might become perpetrators of gun violence, survivors of gun violence, or someone who is even just experiencing vicarious trauma by the constant barrage of shootings, carjackings, drive-bys, and homicides in the city. To date, we've been able to teach hundreds of families, parents, youth, community workers, uh, this evidence-based technique to help reduce and heal trauma from the level of the self. Uh, in hopes that it reduces anger, builds conflict resolution in more positive ways. Our goal and what we're posing is to prevent gun violence and violence in the city is that we have to start at addressing trauma. A few folks have already mentioned this on the call and I just wanna highlight it again that when we work with trauma or if we're not working with it head on, then that can also lead to gun violence. And while gun violence prevention is critical, we can't overlook the fact that increasing numbers of DC residents are experiencing high levels of stress, accumulated grief because of so many senseless shootings to their children, neighbors, and family members. And residents need access to support services and resources to help them cope and thrive. The Meditation Center is committed to collaborating with organizations here in DC that are working to prevent gun violence. However, we find in one of our other suggestions is that we hope to figure out how to find out how we're reaching people, who's doing what. I think everyone's working in silos, but we need to be working together to address this issue. It's not just going to be one pill cures everything. We have to work together in order to heal uh, our community and to heal the city. While preventing gun violence has to be a priority, we can't forget also about those who have survived uh, these violent acts, those who are traumatized and those who are suffering in silence. So I'd like to challenge us that as we're thinking about budget priorities for the next fiscal year, we take into consideration the need for comprehensive services for families and individuals who are directly being affected by gun violence and live with the loss of their loved ones every day. So in closing, I'd like to think um, as we're working on this important um, work around reducing gun violence in our city, let's remember to also focus on our own self-care. Healing trauma and building resilience can contribute to reducing the violence in our communities. Uh, sometimes that means we're working just one person at a time. So another thing I'd also like to offer to um, you all on this call, thank you for your time, is the 
option to also learn uh, this evidence-based technique through our office. P folks are more than welcome to come. You can find us on the ARC campus website, but also uh, through the Meditation Center. Uh, thank you again for your time, and I look forward to taking any questions and continuing to listen to other recommendations that are being made today. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ms. Martinez, and for the work that you do. Look forward to chatting a little more. Next, we will hear from Howard Garrett from DC Young Democrats. Hello, everyone. My name is Howard Garrett. I'm a Ward 2 resident. Um, I first want to start with the conversation about um, changing the narrative of how we are seeing our young people. I believe if, before we're able to come together and find solutions, uh, we have to change the narrative of how we view our young people in the media, um, how we talk about them in conversations, um, in order to understand that we cannot allow a small percentage of young people to distort the image of the overall population of the youth. Um, you have, we have to realize the circumstances and the climate that our young people are dealing with when it comes to school, when it comes to their home with the lack of resources and understanding that many of them are dealing with peer pressure, but also trying to make in me ends meet themselves as they're trying to grow and mature themselves. Um, Secondly, I think we need to come together um, and continue to have conversations, but oftentimes we come together in these conversations and the people uh, or the target audience that we're trying to find solutions for are not at the table to offer solutions with lived experiences. Um, today, it's I know we have different schedules and busy schedules, but uh, our meeting today started at 11 a.m. Uh, many of those parents who are in undeserved populations are at work, um, the students are in school. Um, so we have to, it's my belief that it's possible that we can have solutions or conversations when we have more availability of the audience that we're trying to cater towards and find solutions for, um, especially if we are offering all these solutions and the solutions that we're offering may not be effective or relevant to the needs of what they're looking for to end the issues within our community. Um, and the last thing I wanna mention is, um, yes, police offer, we're supposed to offer a sense of security. Um, we have to tackle the underlying issues that are plaguing our community of poverty, the lack of resources, grocery stores, um, also the programs and opportunities for our young people to engage them, mental illness, opioid use, all of those issues are the foundation of why these issues will continue to proceed. Um, we can add as many police officers as we need, but until we address those underlying issues, these issues will continue to proceed. And then the last thing I want to mention is police relationship within the community. Uh, I think we need to do a better job with ensuring that our police are engaging within the community, building trust, um, and also building relationships um, with the with our community to ensure that we're able to have trust in a system that is often um, viewed as killing black and brown people in our country. Um, there's already a distorted relationship. And if we fail to address the continued uh, systemic issues within the police department, um, you can add as many police officers as you may, but the relationship between the young people and the police officer or the black community and the police officers, um, there will still be trauma and a lack of relationship to create solutions to make our community a safer place for all of us to be. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Garrett. And I do just want to note one of the pieces you mentioned about the inaccessibility for people. It's one of the things that my team and I struggle with and try to um, diversify as much as we can, which is why today we're offering this virtual option for folks. Tomorrow we're having an in-person um, chance for folks to share their thoughts in the Anacostia Neighborhood Library, also at 11 a.m. on a Saturday. We're having our conversation with government folks on Monday. Um, we've had community safety meetings in the past on evenings, weekends, every day of the week. Um, we differentiate every time I do office hours, different days of the week and times of the day, because we understand everyone's schedules are different. 
um, and want to meet people where they are as much as we can. There's never going to be one slot that works for everybody. So we'll keep working towards that. And if you have other ideas on how we can do a better job at that, always open-minded. Thank you. Um, next, we will hear from Calvin Brown from ANC 7B. Uh, greetings, uh, Committee Chairwoman Pinto, other council members, participating guests, speakers, and other elected officials. And happy Friday. My name is Kelvin Brown. I have the opportunity to serve as commissioner for a single member district 7B06 and chairperson for advisory neighborhood commission 7B. I'm humbled to continue working in partnership with so many community groups, elected officials, and advocates in the criminal justice and violent, violence prevention space. I come before this panel to share thoughts around gun violence and how we can work collectively to solve for this ongoing violent crisis throughout the District of Columbia. Gun violence throughout the district has resulted in a climate of fear, intimidation, and uncertainty in our everyday lives. Residents are scared and very fear fearful that they too will be a victim of future gun violence based on this increasing trend. The National Institute for Criminal Justice Reform performed an analysis with the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council, the Metropolitan Police Department, and adjacent agencies. This analysis showed a very perplexing and increasing trend that, as we know, homicides continue to trend upwards. From 2017 to 2020, the analysis showed a drastic 18% year-over-year -year increase. And on its face, this crisis is trending completely in the wrong direction, and residents feel, greatly feel the impact of it every day. According to that same analysis, it was determined that the victims and suspects of, of homicides and other non-fatal shootings are black males between the ages of 18 to 34 years old. And per that study, 96% of the victims and suspects in both the homicides and fatal non-fatal shoots were black, despite residents, black residents comprising only 46% of the population in, in the district. This tells us that we must find an alternate solution to address, directly address and provide support and also hold individuals accountable for actions that put our communities at risk. We must find a holistic solution that includes the Metropolitan Police Department, community advocates, ANC leaders, and other officials. We even have the opportunity through our mental health systems, our annual budget, and other mechanisms to reduce the number of homicides and non-fatal shootings. Just this week alone, here in War 7 in the Hillcrest community, Within ANC 7B, we experienced shootings during the day between the hours of 2 p.m. and 5 p.m. This is during daylight hours. The first incident, an adult male was shot in the torso on Pennsylvania Avenue Southeast and was rushed to the hospital with life-threatening injuries. The second shooting involved a senior citizen at the Safeway parking lot that Mr. Anderson mentioned earlier today, who was shot in the back twice and was an innocent bystander. In this incident, multiple cars were damaged. There was a potential loss, loss of life. Several shell casings were found in the Safeway parking lot. So this was a very tragic and traumatic situation for all of our community members. So to, together, we must move forward and continue to focus on gun violence. We must approach this crisis with a new strategy by not only focusing on the aftermath of gun violence, but focusing on the family structure, as mentioned here today, gun laws, equity, community engagement and accountability. We have to bring the government and its resources directly to the people who need the services the most. The solution has to be bounded in love as mentioned and early, accountability and mutual community respect. This starts by incorporating some of the recommendations that I'll cite. Um, convene what you are doing now, um, a continuing conversation of thought leaders, influencers, the youth, returning citizens and, and others to build a comprehensive, real life, tangible strategy that meets both the victims and suspects where they are on their life journeys. Two, use the budget as a mechanism to fund future and further gun violence initiatives. Like A, establish community-based mobile centers that are accessible to targeted hotspots throughout our city. So just like we did with COVID, we had COVID centers in various communities that were underserved and that were divested in. And what we saw in that sample size is that we saw a greater uptick in the COVID vaccination rates and a lower rate of the transmission. 
B, directly invest in our families, as mentioned earlier. C, audit all programs, assess the value add, and get rid of programs that don't work and increase funding for programs that have shown true value and results and ensure that all programs and program members can undertake continuous learning to the approach of gun violence and prevention. Next couple two, I'll be quick here. Staff the centers with end-to-end -end case management services that prevent dropage, dropage between agencies uh, from services to services. And what we can do is look at other municipalities, towns, villages, and what they're doing as it relates to case management. One great model to take into consideration is a system that is used in North Car Charlotte, North Carolina, called the Aunt Bertha system. It's a fabulous one. Please check that out. Next is conduct door-to-door -door outreach to make sure that our neighbors are apprised of the programs, the services, and the preventative measures that are offered to our community through our government uh, and our governmental services. Target re repeat offenders with programs and services, those on parole, those on probation, um, our school systems, et cetera. And then lastly, as a recommendation, better education, stronger outreach, and be intentional about our engagement is key. One thing that I do know is that divestment in communities leads to dysfunction, and that leads to gun violence. And so I would like to thank the committee for holding this roundtable discussion around this ongoing crisis that is engulfing all of our communities. We have the tools, the right people, and the passion to eradicate this crisis once and for all. And so ANC7B continues to stand with all agencies working to end gun violence. I'm available for all and any questions. And I look forward to a brighter future for all of our residents here in the District of Columbia. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I yield my time. Thank you so much, Chair Brown. Appreciate it. Thank you. And the name of that program you mentioned, is that called Unviolence? Uh, Aunt Bertha. <laughs> Aunt, Aunt, Aunt Violence. Aunt, Aunt, okay. Aunt, Aunt Bertha. A-U-N-T Bertha. B-E-R-T-A. Aunt Bertha. Okay, okay. Bertha. I will... Um, ask you some questions about that at the end of this round. Absolutely. Um, and next and last on this panel, we have Aaron Hall from MedStar Washington Hospital Center Community Violence Intervention Program. Hi, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you all and for holding this community round table. Um, my name is Erin Hall. I'm the medical director for the MedStar Washington Hospital Community Violence Intervention Center, which is our hospital's hospital-based violence intervention program. As a uh, trauma surgeon, just this past weekend, I spent hours in the operating room over the bodies of young black men desperately working to sew and repair damage that was caused by bullets. And uh, while through the dedication of my team and the resources our hospital and the medical system brought to bear, we were able to get those men off the table, I'm increasingly and um, sort of obsessively aware that the real work is only just beginning there. Hospital-based violence intervention programs are evidence-informed, community-driven interventions that are anchored in the idea of providing patient-centered wraparound case management services by well-trained, credible messengers. These uh, credible messengers are known as treatment navigators at CVIP and are the heart of our program. Uh, I'd actually like to take the rest of my time to read testimony from one of our treatment navigators named James Wiggleton. Um, he was unable to be at this round table today because he's, as we speak, uh, providing um, resources for a, a participant of ours in crisis. Uh, but I would like to take the time to read his testimony if I could. So this is from James. Um, as lead navigator, one of my main responsibilities is to ensure that every victim of community-based violence at MedStar Washington Hospital Center, juvenile or adult, has been contacted by either a violence intervention specialist or a treatment navigator. At that immediate vulnerable point, we establish emotional support for an individual before vetting a person who is interested in follow-up support or participation in the CVIP services. While providing such support, which usually focuses on making sure the victim is okay mentally and physically. Navigators learn more of the survivor's community challenges and barriers that the victim faces beyond his injury. 
Once that connection has been made and community challenges and barriers have been identified, my next responsibility is to assure that the victims get connected to the right resource agency. Whether it be victims needs of employment, work development, connection to mental health or community support organizations. Sad to say, this population of injuries tends to be affecting the youth the most, ages 15 to 26. When a youth is violently injured, or even a single adult male who has recently been plagued with a life-altering violent injury, hospital-based treatment navigators have become extremely vital in MedStar with this population of victims rehabbing from gun violent injury. Those who um, even may now be a form of paraplegic with no understanding of how to cope, facilitate, and care for their injury. Treatment navigators ensure these individuals are emotionally supported and help facilitate follow-up rehabs, therapies, et cetera. Individuals who go through this magnitude of injury have at times perished from lack of support and connection from violent injury. Those are able to muster the rehab, overcome the mental emotions of being injured, then they go home but have no income, an unsupported housing situation for their injury, and no transport transportation or resources for obtaining supplies and medication. Here at MedStar uh, Community Violence Intervention Program, uh, we've allowed, also allowed for legal aid uh, through our medical legal partnership to assist and support our survivors with applying for SSI, SSDI, child support, housing, and et cetera. These resource agencies and connections uh, allow increased magnitude of ways to continuously and effectively support our community of survivors of violent injury. From now, having strong and solid connections and relationships with agencies such as Wendt Center for Mental Health, NVRDC for victims who have been unfairly handled as a survivor and treated as suspects, or victim services for lost wages and safe housing placement. All these and more are possible by the support um, that we get from the DC government and is appreciated by the survivors and the providers who vowed to serve. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ms. Hall, and thank you for the work that you do. Um, so I wanna start with you, Ms. Martinez. Um, thank you so much for your testimony. I know that the Office of Neighborhood Safety and Engagement has programming for victims and families. Have you worked with them at all in offering your services? Um, we have uh, had some initial meetings, but we haven't had time yet to set up a program with their site. Um, interestingly, we just have a meeting with the Office of um, OSVJ. I can't remember all of the letters right now, but OS, OSVJ. G. There's the a lot of victim services and justice. Oh, problems. that is. <laughs> yeah. Listen, it's oh, been a long time. This has been a long day, y'all. It's been a long day and a long week. But yes, we just had a meeting with them literally on Thursday about um, uh, providing service not only to staff, but the families that they're serving. Um, they've been receiving requests from families looking for some social emotional tools and support and read about us on, on uh, just found us on Google. And we just had that meeting literally on Thursday. So that's why the names are not as familiar in my head. Mm -hmm. Okay, glad to hear that. Yeah, OVSJG. OVSJG, um, there we go. Yes, we all yes. know what, what <laughs> you're referring to, the Office of Victim Services and Justice Grants. And I'm glad to hear about that partnership and they're doing really excellent work as well. Um, Definitely. Meeting victims where they are and getting them the supports that they need. Thank you, yes, definitely. Um, Mr. St. Phil, you talked about the, I kind of like this idea of not using what we're seeing on a macro scale for our DC issues specifically. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that on, um, of something that might be a need locally in DC, but that's kind of missed from the conversation when we think about these macro trends. Well, you know, when, when a victim comes into a hospital based violence intervention program and they receive assistance, I mean, that assistance is geared toward that individual victim and their family, right? So then when we're working with these victims, so if we're working with a victim, you know, in Northwest, you know, who from Kennedy Street, but then a shot goes off in Northeast, 
all of a sudden then these programs don't work but what, what, what are you talking about this 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 victim is from kennedy in the northwest and the shot goes off in northeast and you're saying that these programs don't work it is not a fair barometer of the effectiveness of those programs those programs are not working in every corner of the city and implementing intervention interventions that work on a macro level their work is essentially micro in nature they're working with victims on an individual basis and their families and so at the end of the day the outcomes that need to be looked at and the effectiveness of these programs are the outcomes that these individuals are having as a result of their interaction with those programs but to think that these programs that are working with individual victims and families are going to continue in that mission and then impact societal gun violence that's just a misnomer um there's so many other there's so many other things that we need to, to, to consider to take into consideration of a more holistic approach to gun violence of which hospital based violence intervention programs are just one but in the media they're being vilified because they're being viewed as a panacea which they are not right they need support from what everybody said on this call right we need all hands on deck um to support you know what's going on with the trauma before they get victimized what's going on after they get victimized what's going on with the historical trauma they can their communities and their families experience um and so no they're not suited or they're not it's not fair to blame them that gun violence is still going on on a societal level but what we can um uh, applaud them for is the work that they are doing on an individual micro level basis helping some of these individual victims who some of them have that victim perpetrator overlap and helping them refrain from violence and improve positive outcomes in their lives I got you and I agree with that and I'll just say from my perspective I am um certainly some very supportive of these programs and it's hard to demonstrate what you can't see and hard to demonstrate what's prevented um but we know that it's still very important to support and expand um so appreciate that thank you Mr. for your question Kier, thank you um thank you so much for all of your ideas that you shared and i know i highlighted a little bit of uh, my agreement that we need to be diversifying the days of the week and times of the week that we're having meetings so we can meet people where they are. And last Saturday, I had another um, youth hearing with my Ward 8 colleague, Councilmember Tram White at the RISE Center to hear from young people about what they would like to see for additional supports in their communities. Do you have any other ideas on how to bring in people with lived experience to these conversations, particularly around gun violence um, and about your ideas of community policing that can build trust? Is there um, a model that you've seen work well that you can, uh, you want to highlight so we can try to expand it? Um, as for a model, I'm currently viewing one from um, a candidate that was with the Chicago uh, mayor. So I'm kind of reviewing that and I can send that over to you uh, to look at. I can email that over to you. Um, as for getting more engagement, I think uh, with lived experience, I think we have to first start off with showing people that, you know, these conversations go beyond trying to find solutions, um, but actually implementing those solutions. So last week, um, you know, we had, you did have a youth hearing uh, with the young people express their concerns, the trauma uh, with police officers, uh, solutions with the resources from homes, uh, resources, with programs um, that are that would benefit them, um, I think you know it was kind of shocking to see the uh, halting of the uh, SROs in the schools after the kids stated that it brings them trauma. Um, so you know we have to think of like after that was signed, after you know that conversation was held, what kind of image does that portray? Um, and as we figure out how to garner more solutions, um, we need to have those young people sitting around the table and maybe have some type of announcement or presentation to show that, hey, we are listening to build some sort of trust within our government so they feel like they're a part of the solution. Uh, these conversations are very healthy, um, but I also think we need to continue to go a step further and to ensure that you know, we're showing that those impl the implementation of the solutions that they offered are present as well. 
Okay. Thank to, you so to much. get more engagement. Yeah. No, I think that's a powerful example. And I'll just say briefly on the school resource officer issue. This is something that we've been working on for months. This is not something that happened right after that hearing. And I hear from young people and families and teachers from our school communities every single day begging me to put school resource officers and make sure that they can be sustained in their school communities, particularly where we're seeing the most violence. And I don't want to um, you know, overemphasize the most egregious dramatic instances, but when there are weapons brought to school and teachers being harmed and young people being shot at, and there are no officers available to assist, that is not fair in my view to put on teachers. That is a burden too high to ask our teachers to take on when they're doing such important work. And I think what we need to do is really heed the calls from our young people to make sure that our school resource officers are trauma informed, are trained on how to deal with young people, that they're not kind of using this as um, a place for just arrests, that they're really part of the solution. And that is what I continue to hear from young people as well, that will push forward as we push for mental health supports and resources in our schools as well. I will continue to listen um, to all voices, but that that is an issue that I have been consistent on for, for years and continue to, to feel the need to respond to their school communities who tell me every day that they, they really need this, this program in their schools. And um, I also think it's important for, you know, when the SROs are in the schools to you know, build relationships with the students to build a trust and not only show up when um, an incident happens, but, you know, give encouragement, you know, show that, you know, we're not the bad guys or we're not here to just take you to jail, but we're here to, so you can build trust and feel safe and have a relationship and build a community. Um, I think, you know, that narrative also needs to change as well, um, which can, you know, benefit both sides of the spectrum where students do feel safe, but also don't, are not afraid to have conversations um, with SROs um, instead of having the image of you only see when you're handcuffing someone and walking them out the door. So I also think that um, that is important as well. Yeah. No, Pinto, great point. I I just totally to Go ahead. This, um, on this SRO issue. So I agree with all of your sentiments. I totally understand and I am in 100% agreement. I think one of the, the key elements that I haven't heard anything anyone address as it relates to SROs is that many of the students don't understand the actual difference between the SROs, their duties, why they're in schools versus the, the, the clothed uniform police officers that they see out in the community. And they equate the two to be the same and have the same role, responsibilities, and duties. I think there might be an opportunity for some direct one-to-one, -one, a direct uh, community and great engagement with our community um, school environments about the overall purpose, responsibility, duties, and objective of SRO programs, so they can further bridge some of those gaps. Because I think knowledge and edu education plays a, a big role in this as well. Thank you so much. I think that's a great point as well. Um, and we can certainly play a role there in education, but also encouraging the school safety division to heed the calls for a different type of model. Both things can exist, that we have SROs in schools and that we have a different type of, of model that is for kids and that is treating kids like kids. Um, and part of that is building trust and that education piece. So I appreciate that. Um, Commissioner, I also want to ask you to elaborate a little bit on the Aunt Bertha program um, that you talked about in North Carolina, I believe, and kind of what that what that looks like in practice. Yeah, so that so so um, in my in my other role in my full time nine to five job, I work in housing, um, and one of the programs that we were working on was uh, with a uh, a sub. Uh, supplier or a partner that serve underserved, marginalized, divested communities um, in the Charlotte uh, region. And it was a major hospital institution. And one of the things that we were working on from a, uh, from a philosophical standpoint is that housing is a, is a, is a prescription for better health outcomes. 
And one of the things that the data showed when we were going through our pilot programs was that if you were able to get someone in a, in a stable, functioning, affordable house, that lowered the overall, that increased social determinants of health, which played a part in education, housing, employment, um, violence, community engagement, all of those adjacencies to house. And so I think that is the same, is in the same vein as violence is considered. And so one of the outcomes of that particular work was a, a readaptation of an online case management system that clinical workers and clinicians use to be a tool to help when someone came into the hospital setting, for example, and they might have a, had an injury or health ailments and needed to see a doctor or a nurse, a medical professional, they went through a triage or an assessment. What is your, what's your name? What's your background? What's your demographics? What are you coming in to see us today for? Okay, to go through that, that first panel of questions. Are you housing insecure? Are you having any financial issues? Are you having domestic violence in your household? Are you susceptible to uh, lower, have uh, students in the house that might be experiencing bullying or trauma? So it goes through a battery of questions with their individual case manager on a one-to-one -one basis. And so that system on the back end has all of those resources from housing. So affordable housing providers and the city of Charlotte would empty, empty in their availability from housing vouchers that would connect to the system. And so if an indicator or flag is, is checked that someone is housing insecure, there's a direct referral for that person, not necessarily for them to follow up, but the housing professional follow directly up with them, work with their case manager. So it was a hub and spoke model that provided for services, wraparound services for a person, even though they came in for healthcare, medical professionals now are working with their adjacent sectors to make sure that we take care of the whole person and the whole body. And that includes um, and results in positive outcomes in the community. Thank you so much. That's really powerful. And I love to hear that. And there's some great work going on in DC, kind of the individualized hospital level. When I was a student at Georgetown Law School, I was part of this pilot program for medical legal partnership um, at the time was operating out of DC General. And we found so many of the issues that people came in for, for medical issues were really connected to legal issues. If somebody was coughing a lot, we may be able to find out that there's mold in their unit um, and having medical professionals and lawyers on site working together on full holistic case management. Um, and it sounds like, you know, social workers in this model mm -hmm is really a much more productive path forward to make sure we're helping support the whole individual and not being so piecemeal with some of our interventions. Absolutely. Um, and I think, and I think, and the last thing I'll say, I think DC has a very robust offering of program and services that are really rich in funding, right? As opposed to other locales around and municipality, towns and villages throughout the nation. But I think one of the pain points with that is that the resources that are available, two pain points, the resources that are available, they're siloed. So one department or one agency doesn't necessarily speak to the other. And then when they do speak to the other, there's a droppage in coverage. There's a, it's not things fall through the crack, which leaves the individual kind of out there on their own. And it develops this, well, the government is not doing anything to help me. This is, they're building this for the other people that are coming. It's not for me, et cetera. And then I think the second point is, is that we have to, as I mentioned in my testimony, we have to treat this as a crisis and we have to get the resources to the communities that need it the most. And that means putting the resources actually in the communities where the hot spots have already been identified. We know who the repeat offenders are. Put the resources there. They can't be all downtown. They can't be all at the, you know, around the Wilson building. They have to be in Ward 7. They have, they have to be in Ward 8. They have, they have to be in Dean Wood, you know, have Dean Wood. They have to be in Benning Terrace, Clay Terrace, Minnesota and Benning Road. Put those hubs there with the technology and infrastructure to support people and meet them at their greatest need. And we will see results um, as it relates to community and gun violence. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Really appreciate that. Good idea. Um, and Ms. Hall, can you 
comment on some of this where and when we think about coordination of of all the services that we do have available where are you seeing some of the biggest gaps with the clients that you serve patients you serve yeah um you know i would say like i would echo dr donnelly's testimony from earlier that um we're actually finding more coordination with through the office of gun violence prevention but i think that um there is an intrinsic mistrust that's well earned for um, for systematic databases that cross over multiple um, you know multiple agencies. So that if a person is touched by a community violence intervention program, we may not know it as a hospital violence intervention program, even though we may be trying to provide many of the same services. For instance, or somebody you know maybe working and trying to get um, their housing or safe housing addressed with um, crime victims compensation, for instance, but also approaching building blocks and other um, resources that might be out there. And so I think that we could really use a unified, but as also Dr. Donnelly suggested, patient-centered and participant respectful um, coordination system of just data and even something you know we i think it was mentioned earlier uh before of um well there's so many resources and we know that there's so many individuals that are fighting and working on this on community level in dc but every single one has a different intake form or every single one has a different um you know certain process that you have to go through and hoops that you have to jump through and is there a way to even uh you know smooth that out over say organizations that receive OVSJG funding or something like that like can we work together to get one intake form and then coordinate care across agencies rather than um, each trying to do to cobble together our own own pieces of it and I think it will ultimately you know if we can do it responsibly with multi-year funding with appropriately resourced we could also think about then looking at powerful outcomes from our whole violence intervention web rather than one, you know, any specific um, pieces of that web. Thank you so much. I love that idea. I know you're, I'm seeing a lot of nodding on this panel. So um, I'd love to, to work towards that. All right. Well, thank you so much to everybody on this panel. Really appreciate you being here and your great ideas. Uh, we are going to move on to our next panel. We're going to hear from Paulette Jones Bell Iman from the International Association for Human Values, Lisa Rice from ANC 7B07, and Tia Bell, the founder of the Trigger Project. And if you were on an earlier panel but not here, please flag for me or my team so we can make sure to promote you. as well. All right, if you are ready to go, we'll start with Paulette jones Bellimon from the International Association for Human Values. Good afternoon, and I am grateful Good afternoon, and I'm very, very grateful to be here, to be a part of this uh, wonderful panel. I am Paulette Jones, Belly Manon. I am a Sky Schools teacher um, and work with the International Association for Human Values. Sky Schools, or Sky, is a program that brings the sky meditation and values program to schools and to, and to organizations, educators and teachers and, and families. Um, the reality about what is going on, the prevention, we have one major enemy. The enemy is not the children, not the people who are doing, it is stress and it is trauma. And the trauma is affecting all of us, not one, but everyone. 
who watches, who looks at it, who knows that it's going on. It is, it is an, um, it is the insidious enemy that is killing us. Not through, not only through gun violence. I represent an organization, the International Association for Human Values, and several other, who brings the power of the breath to this situation. The, the breath brings relief of this trauma, but what happens when we are under stress and in that fight or flight, we have heard so much about this vagus nerve. We've heard so much about uh, cortisol and, and what it does is it blinds us. It really cuts off our thinking process. And our, our um, solution is to use our simple tool of the breath to bring the, the to reduce the cortisol and bring us back into a calm and, and a situation where we can uh, bring relief. The, the um, International Association of Human Battle, Values has, has partnered with Youth and Family Crisis and Ivy Hilton to bring this program to to our um, community and especially starting with our community leaders. In this particular crisis, um, the community leaders are the ones who would be most uh, effect, helpful, helped by this situation. We have um, scheduled an introductory session to the sky breath with some experience of meditation. And we've invited over 50 leaders to come and share. And I want to send and extend the invitation to you, to the uh, persons who are sitting here. We are presently implementing a program at Baloo High School. And our first focus at this particular point are the teachers. We know that they are on the front line and the violence in the schools are tremendously harmful to the whole educational process. So we're bringing these techniques to the teachers and to the staff and, and, the, uh, and, and, the, and the administration. So that is our, our um, pilot program happening now. Last year, we had a chance to teach just a few, the 10th grade students in a short program, in a program that was about six weeks. And what happened in that program, 99% of the students who took the survey suggested that this class should be offered to all of the students. They said that this program helped them to feel more calm, more peaceful, more productive in their classrooms. They also said that they would recommend the program for their, um, for their students, for their other students. And so that's why we think that this is a solution that the whole community could use. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Jonesy Ma. I look forward to speaking with you a little bit more about that. Even, even just your background is calming. I appreciate the work <laughs> that you do. Uh, next, we will hear from Lisa Rice from ANC 7B07. Go ahead, Commissioner. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you. First, before I start, so don't clock, start the clock. Miss Jonesy Mon, you just put me in a zone. <laughs> just <laughs> with the, I was like, wow, I'm with her. All right, um, let me <laughs> bring up my testimony. But I, I had to say, thank you so much. Good afternoon, Chairwoman Pinto, Council Member Nadeau, and community members. My name is Lisa Rice. My pronouns are she/her. 
I'm a Ward 7 resident and voter, now living in the home my husband and I renovated in 2015, which my father and uncles built in 1964. My family moved into this home when I was just three years old. Born and raised in DC, over the past 62 years, I have lived in wards six, seven, and eight. I've also lived and worked in New York City, Boston, New Orleans, and Fairfax County, Virginia. My son, an early literacy teacher in the DC public schools, and I lived in this same home with my parents when he was very young from 1998 to 2004. In other words, I represent a multi-generational family with strong ties to and a vested interest in this community. Mine is just one of many very long-term neighborhood families. On my block, residents range in age from four to 84. Our newest neighbor moved in about 25 years ago. Beyond our block, we have a vibrant, well-established community with households new and old. If you were to describe our neighborhood as quiet, a little dull and boring, I wouldn't challenge that perception. There has been though a slow drumbeat of violence that is shattering the quiet and calmness of our neighborhood. We too have seen an uptick in gun violence. A few years ago, what sounded like gunshots rang out on New Year's Eve. We paid no attention really until the next day when we discovered what appeared to be a bullet hole in the hood of my husband's car. Apparently, a random gunshot ricocheted and thankfully damaged property only, not a person. The incident itself was startling. When the police responded though, we were even more stunned by one officer's comment that he didn't even know these homes existed. Ouch. What did that statement imply about that officer's regard for us, the residents, the people who live in these homes in this very well-established neighborhood? Over the past 12 months, neighbors have discovered dispensed handgun shells on separate occasions at opposite ends of our dull, boring block. We hear gunshots at random times at all hours of the day and night. Many do not feel safe, feelings bubbling to the surface as you'd expect our fear, anger, frustration, and much more. I have deep, deep concern about an uptick in what's growing out of that frustration, resentment, disillusionment, and a hint of vigilantism on the part of a small number of very vocal neighbors. This may be a warning sign and it frightens me. I don't want our neighborhood to become a community where vigilantism erupts in the most heinous way with the killing of a child. In January of this year, I was sworn into office as the Advisory Neighborhood Commissioner representing SMD 7 B07, which includes the Penn Branch neighborhood and parts of the Fort Davis communities. I am the chair of ANC 7B's Committee on Public Safety and the Judiciary. I am also a member of Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America. I believe we must address this plague the escalating gun violence in DC generally and in 7B specifically from multiple perspectives. A complex problem deserves a multi-pronged collaborative approach addressing the impacts of the pandemic, shared trauma from traffic and gun violence, personal and community safety, and indeed the longing to be valued. Let's talk about COVID. I believe the escalating gun violence is a symptom of the continued elongated public health crisis triggered by COVID. COVID is not over. Let me repeat, COVID is not over. Many households fell into disarray in 2020 and not all have recovered. Significant parts of the community have been ill-served on this front and continue to be as we move from pandemic to endemic. Children who were left unsupervised for two full years and in many cases exposed to escalating violence in their own homes need help. Where is the support for these children, for these families, for these households? On to shared trauma. I am deeply concerned by the ongoing deep trauma experienced and shared by residents of this community as a result of the unrelenting gun violence. Every human being has a right to feel safe and secure in their homes and outside in the community. We should not live in fear that our next trip to the grocery store may end with gunshots, injury, or death. On to safety. As the mother of a DC public school teacher who has shared his experience, experiences of active shooter drills and lockdowns, I've heard a lot about safety in our schools. 
Our conversation when he came over for dinner earlier this week on Tuesday, February 28th, which was supposed to focus on planning a family vacation, it was derailed by the discussion of a lockdown at his school that day. Why the lockdown? There was a shooting less than one tenth of a mile from the school at the Safeway, which was mentioned in earlier testimony. Our teachers and students deserve to feel safe and secure. And finally, value. Put plainly, many of my constituents feel forsaken and forgotten by law enforcement, district agencies, the mayor, their Ward 7 council member, specifically in the council, council overall. Do you value us as individuals, as a community? Do you value our lives? I've had more than one constituent tell me that they feel we're, we're treated as a colony, that the perception is we're not people, not human. Where was the outrage when these shootings occurred back to back here in 7B earlier this week? Do not forsake us. Don't forget us. Before closing, I'd like to share some sentiments from a 7B neighbor who is too afraid to testify publicly because of escalating violence, some of which has touched too close to her home. As background, one incident was a homicide which took place behind her house and has been unsolved for over a year. The second incident was an armed carjacking which occurred when she wasn't home, but was captured on her doorbell video with trauma-inducing audio of her neighbor's screams for help that drove this, this resident to tears. Here in part is what she wants you to know. If mental health issues aren't taken seriously, I don't believe we can get out of this. It seems nobody is willing to take on guns, either nationally or locally. There are such low expectations for black people that the effort needed to truly help heal people goes well beyond just putting them in a house. While that is necessary, healing has to come from within. I think as a culture and community, black people have to be honest about the impacts of slavery, segregation, poverty, and always being seen as inferior and what that does to one's mental health over time. Add on poverty, bad schooling, low expectation, fear, substance abuse, and systemic racism, and you have a mess. So um, as I began, as I began my sure, testimony, I'm going to ask you to wrap up your about three minutes over time. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. I, I really, really quick. Um, it's a complex problem. We need and crave a multi, multi-pronged sustained effort to extricate ourselves. No simple solution. At the very least, though, stand with us when we're attacked, defend our humanity, and we look forward to finding a collaborative, multifaceted solution. Chairwoman Pinto, I will make myself available anytime you'd like to, to discuss this further one-on-one. -on -one. Please consider this an open invitation to my home. I am on record as offering this to our local patrol lieutenant who has yet to accept. I hope you'll take me more seriously than they have. I am willing to do whatever it takes to get us on course. Thank you all for your time today, careful consideration of this issue um, and the impact it's having on the families. Thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Um, next, we will hear from Tia Bell, founder and CEO of The Trigger Project. Please go ahead. Happy Friday, everybody. Um, I pray that everyone is well and warm under the sound of my voice. Uh, good afternoon, Councilwoman Pinto. I appreciate you, your opportunity uh, that you presented us with through, of course, this uptick in um, crises. Uh, but I also appreciate your leadership and your grace, um, your stance. And uh, of course, my name is Tia Bell. I am the founder of The Trigger Project. I am a mommy of two beautiful children. Um, I'm an advocate, I'm a defender, I'm a survivor, I'm a protector. Um, I come to you all today as just one woman, um, but I represent close to a thousand young people who have opened their hearts to me to our program, to our curriculum, to the essence of prevention, but who feel invisible. My mother was shot when I was 10 years old um, and graciously 
She survived. Uh, she was shot as a result of interpersonal gun violence, not city gun violence, not community gun violence, not all of these names that blame us, but interpersonal gun violence um, that were women and that were women from a neighborhood that I played basketball in. And during that time, basketball was my grace, my savior, my vehicle. At the time, it opened up uh, opportunity for me to receive coaching, supervision, just a safe haven. And what I didn't know 20 years later was that that was my vehicle. That was my path to prevention. I am proof of prevention. My young people who feel invisible and unseen and unheard are proof of prevention. Trigger stands for true reasons I grab the gun evolved from risk. True reasons I grab the gun evolve from risk. So when you say the Trigger Project, you embody the compassion and the comprehensive approach and the voice of the shooter, of the potential shooter, of the unseen. We attack gun violence and aim to prevent gun violence through the essence and intersection of public health and positive youth development. I was the first in my family uh, to go finish high school and get a, go to college and get a master's in youth development. So under the youth development round in my program, we're looking at uh, meeting our young people individually where they are, serving them as mentors, as an outlet, as someone that they can call to voice their pain instead of pick up a gun to, 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 to place, replace their words. We work on their social emotional learning, their healing, and we meet them where they are. And under the public health model, we look at really aiming to change the narrative of public safety and public health. Public health is the science of protection. And that is what our city lacks, Councilwoman. Councilwoman. We do not understand or we're not given a chance to the science of prevention. That's looking at real data that we've already described on this call that doesn't exist. That's looking at bringing a comprehensive uh, approach, meaning bringing a whole government and a whole community, not just some communities that have favor and get the, the budget or the, the grants, or not just some government agencies that we think have the solution or the programs, but a whole community, a whole government together and using the science to prevail and ending this disease from spreading. We teach our young people as change agents that gun violence is a disease that spreads through model behavior. And they're now spreading that narrative so that our young people know that when you wake up and you don't have supervision, you don't have a good school to go to, you don't, you have the concentrated poverty. These are the root causes and risk factors that lead you to being on either side of the gun. And it's unfortunate in our city that our young people are not seen until they're shot or they're gone. It's easier for our organization to ask for funding that we get zero funding from the city. And it's very hard to get funding from, from donors because of how do you measure the absence of disease? Prevention is the absence of. Where there's no COVID, there's no obesity, there's no hypertension, there's no, gu there's no gun violence. That is valuable. But an $115 million budget with zero true primary prevention present in that budget tells us that our people, our young people don't matter. Intervention will not prevail without prevention. Public safety will not prevail without prevention. And I love Sky for the, the Sky team for healing our healers. Our young people's brains are stunted by this trauma. And the hippocampus part of your brain, the part that helps you be creative and make decisions, that is stunted every day. But crime victims unit, I'm sorry, the crime victims agency tells me I can't support you. They can't support us in supporting young people who lost their friend because they're not the direct victim or direct family. We have to open it up to everybody. There's victims, there's shooters, there's survivors, there's witnesses, there's general population. We all are suffering from this bullet. And it does not include. And then just one, two, two real life examples. I was doing a healing circle last night in the community of young men. The gun recovery unit showed up and intruded the entire situation. And that was their prevention. But our prevention was working. There was no gun violence present. There was no gun present. But our city funds that approach. I'm shaking right now because they violated us. You have to add public health if you demand, if you, if you use your lips to say this is a public health crisis. We have 127 youth in our program last summer. They went to Trigger University. They have a pathway to prevention. 
Let that be a model. Fund everyone on this call that's saying they're doing the work. Don't use, council member, please, in your new position, do not use everything that we're saying to build more government. Bring us to the table, fund us on the ground, invest in the medicine, invest in the youth. And your legacy will live longer than four years of appointment. Or I don't, I'm, I'm not even sure how long it is. Politics are still my, my weakness, but I will say I am the voice of the people who feel invisible. And Trigger does not get nothing, and people think we do. And it put us in compromising positions in our neighborhoods and where we serve, because I got youngins everywhere. But people feel like we're territorial, we have more, and we have nothing. Your, your office was the first office to, to give me an honorarium. I've been used and abused. Invest in prevention, bring us to the table, invest in the boots on the ground, figure out a rapid response to get us what we need now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Bell, for all the work that you do and for joining us at the, what I think you're referring to as our public safety yes. event last fall that we had um, where you were, spoke really powerfully there as well. Um, and we heard from the Attorney General, but at the time, Carl Racine, uh, and the U.S. Attorney, Matthew Graves, and the Chief of Police. And I think we need to continue having many of the partners at the same table so we can figure out where we can lean on each other for different parts of the apparatus that are more effective as opposed to working in conflict with one another. Um, yeah, so we're, we're in this people... together. How many people work uh, with you, Trigger Project? Oh, I, I, we have over 80 partners that we use as a referral network of resources. And we have a team of 10 that are volunteer, wow. including me as the executive director. People who move couches so young men can sleep, who, who, call, who call substance abuse prevention facilities out of the state because inside DC, if a youngin is addicted, they either go into custody in DYRS or their parents are reported. So we have, we have a team, we have the capacity. It's not just me. It's only, I'm the face. I make no decision without youth. We have 21 youth interns right now. I voluntarily run an internship program and our youth go on panels, speaking from the national gun violence organizations. They, they helping their friends call me. We have 82 young people signed up to be in our summer youth employment program. I didn't do a single second of marketing other than on my Instagram story, not even a post. The youth want change. They're stuck in a cultural violence norm of gun violence, yes, but we're teaching them it's a disease. So we're combating that. But also it's structural violence. Again, I get... I get a call for a vigil to put together balloons, but I can't celebrate a young person's birthday who will go rob somebody to celebrate his birthday. That's an issue. That's structural violence. It's killing us. And I know there's a lot of programs, but we got to do two things. The government has to put us first. You guys, you guys have a, a monumental role to play, no pun. But it's not the first role. It's not the first role. Because the community represents the support. You all are the services. And that together is sooner than later, it's, no, it's not going to be no government agency, certain ones, because we really got to the root. And housing is an issue. Trying to find someplace safe for my youngest to lay their head is an issue. We need a comp, it is a comprehensive, we do a comp, we build a comprehensive plan every year at our conference. Shout out to Rachel, shout out to Parent Watch, shout out to Sober Living Project, Bo Yoga. We have 80 partners. You, you, you council member, most people have been a part of this conference and we've built the plan. Invest in the community plan. And I'll send it to you so you can revisit it, but we did too. And you were a part of that. You helped lead some of the breakout sessions. I've modeled, Trigger has modeled of uh, um, collaboration, but we got to get rid of the big eyes, the little U's and come together. There should be a call every day with, where we stop and talk about what happened yesterday in terms of gun violence. There was for COVID, 
And then we announced building blocks and said, we're going to treat gun violence like COVID. And we did it. And then we started an office of gun violence prevention and they can't fund prevention. Huh. Thank you. Uh, it's so true. And in order to know what to do tomorrow, we have to know what happened yesterday, um, yes. especially with some of the immediacy around retaliation that we see um, yeah. to keep people safe. Yes. So the retaliation, but then the younger siblings or the cousins or the family members of those, they're in, we, I was that, I was impacting and I didn't know what, what this cloud was around me. I never even addressed the trauma from my mother until now. I suppressed it because I was the oldest and then I became the parent. But thank God I had basketball. Yeah. You know, so that like, it, it's very individualized, like trying to start my nonprofit, working through DCRA, and they change their name. And then we, they do webinars, but the webinars are, are not for me, not for the questions I have. So that's how we have to look at it. You, you guys are doing like a blanket approach and it's so many individual needs. And then the referrals, people don't answer the phone. My dad was just trying to make a doctor's appointment in the car with me. I just dropped him off. He used to be a violence interrupter. He's attended Peace Academy. He's a notable person in this city who's transformed. He could not make a doctor's appointment within the time of me being in the car with him for 30 minutes. Because y'all see how 295 is right now. Construction is going up, but we're not building up our people. This is a crime. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Commissioner, I want to um, touch on one of the pieces you said about community feeling forgotten, and that um, is so important to address robustly, um, because we do value the lives of all of our residents in D.C., and we need to make sure that we're listening to people about what it is they need. And you also talked about some of the uh, lack of trust between the community and law enforcement. And one way to address that might be to have more law enforcement officers actually live in the communities they serve. What do you think about that um, as one path forward? Um, well, we actually have law enforcement officer that lives around the corner a couple of blocks up. I think that, um, you know, most neighborhoods could benefit from that. Um, I also think that sometimes there are neighbors, uh, residents who have come in and I'm thinking, the reason I'm, I'm thinking about a neighbor who has moved in, they live on the same block as this officer um, and they've, um, they're, they're, they're pretty abusive to the other neighbors, but just, like skirting the lot, like th they're just on the inside of what would be illegal. It's almost like they know what they're doing. But I, I, you know, I'm a fan of law enforcement to live in our neighborhoods um, because they don't know what's going on if they're not there, right? Um, <clears throat> and you, you asked the first part of your question, remind me, Again, what you were asking the, the first part, because I jumped on the second part. Oh, I was just talking about how powerful it was to hear you talk um, about, you know, neighbors feeling forgotten and yeah. trying to think about other actionable ways that we can make sure that's not the case, that people are not forgotten and that they don't feel that way. Yeah. And I, I, I don't, you know, we can't change the past, but geez, you know, um, that with those back-to-back -back shootings here in um, ANC 7B and, you know, I wouldn't have known as quickly had my son not been caught in a lockdown because the school that he teaches at is so close to that Safeway. Mm -hmm. You know, there it it's mm -hmm. as if we as a community have been, uh, you know, we're numb. And I don't mean just 7B, but that you know, it's, it's been a long haul, you know, and, and um, we've become numb to so much, you know, but um, we, we do 
you know, many, many of us do feel forsaken and do feel forgotten. And, um, and, and we, I certainly have the wherewithal to know that, you know, I, I can, I can soldier on, but everyone doesn't have that wherewithal. Um, and, you know, as I said, I would love for you to come. Um, you're always welcome in my home and we can talk one-on-one. And I just got a text from uh, Chair Brown and he says, you know, we want you to come here. So <laughs> you have a dual invitation. Um, and I really, I really mean that because I don't think that, um, you know, postage stamp um, faces on a screen service us. It, it helps, but, you know, we'd love to have you over here. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate that invitation and I will take you up on it. I would love to come visit with you and Chair Brown um, Great. in 7B. And I think that's a good place for us to end today too on the numbness. I pledge to you and your neighbors and anybody listening today that I will never become numb to this gun violence. It is unacceptable. And I am outraged today and I will continue to be outraged as we push forward for more solutions, long-term, medium-term, and immediate solutions. Awesome. Um, So thank Thank you you. very much. Thank you all so much for joining us today. I'd like to thank all of our public witnesses for their testimony today. And as I stated in my opening remarks, the rates of gun violence we've been experiencing in the district continue to be a very real and dire emergency. This testimony we heard today underscored this fact and the urgency of this work. We must take decisive action to get dangerous, illegal guns out of the district and especially keep them out of the hands of young people. We must ensure that our gun violence reduction and prevention programs are working in concert, and that we're both giving these programs the appropriate supports, listening to the community as we heard today and and empowering our community groups to do this work, and that we're ensuring through good data and rigorous accountability measures that our government programs are working as intended. And we must ensure that the services and supports these programs are provided are actually reaching those in need. I loved the idea shared today about consistency and intake. I think that's a really good suggestion among many good suggestions we heard today. Before we adjourn, I'd like to remind those following along that tomorrow, Saturday, March 4th, the committee will be holding an in-person roundtable for public witnesses at the Anacostia Neighborhood Library located at 1800 Good Hope Roads in Southeast. That roundtable will begin at 11 a.m. And everyone is welcome to join us at the library tomorrow, even if you testified at today's hearing or just want to listen. Members of the public can also watch that hearing live, which will be streamed on my YouTube channel, which is at CM Brook Pinto. So at C-M-B-R-O-O-K-E-P-I-N-T-O. And finally, on Monday, March 6th, this coming Monday, the committee will convene a third roundtable to hear from the government agencies leading our work on gun violence prevention and reduction will be joined in person by the Deputy Mayor for Public Safety, the Chief of the Metropolitan Police Department, the District of Columbia Attorney General, Brian Schwab, the U.S. Attorney for the District, as well as the Directors of the Office of Safety and Neighborhood Engagement, the Office of Victim Services and Justice Grants, the Department of Youth Rehabilitation Services, and the Office of Gun Violence Prevention. We will also hear from several national experts on gun violence prevention on Monday. There being no further business before the committee, the time is now 2.55 p.m. on Friday, March 3rd. I wanna thank you all so much again for being part of this work. 